Yes. Very good. Okay, good. Well, um, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Ann Durham. I'm the Vice President and Chief Officer of Innovation and Strategy for the American Printing House for the Blind. And I am so very honored today to introduce Kasaya Timmons. She's the Principal Product Designer of Mobile Apps for Verizon Media. And her accessibility team collaborates with developers and engineers to make Verizon's apps and websites completely accessible to people with disabilities. Visually impaired herself, Kasaya proves what people with vision loss can accomplish. Can accomplish. <clears throat> Technology development and coding are career paths that are wide open to people who are visually impaired. And at APH, we see that future. And that's the idea behind many of the products that we develop, like CodeJumper, uh, which teaches students how to write computer code. This was originally designed by Microsoft and developed by APH. And it, it is a tactile educational tool that opens up the world of coding to students who are visually impaired and teaches them basic programming concepts and problem solving skills that are needed for this career. This and accessibility and universal design are Kasaya's specialty, and they go hand in hand with the technology careers of the future. So again, very honored to introduce to you and let's hear from her. She's gonna tell us all about how just successful this career path can be, Kasaya. Thanks for that warm welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, uh, thanks uh, to all the, the young people, the students that have joined in. Um, um, again, I am Kasaya uh, Timmons, and um, I work to make sure that our mobile apps at Verizon Media are designed with accessibility in mind. And I always start by out by telling people that you know Verizon Media is home to Yahoo, AOL, TechCrunch. Um, a lot of people don't know that. Um, so just want to let give you some perspective of, of um, the type of products um, that I work on. Um, within my background, my undergraduate degree is not in computer science. It is in electrical engineering. And um, I came to the engineering field at a young age. Um, I was inspired to do that by a science fair judge that looked at my backboard and she encouraged me to, to continue along that path. But within my engineering curriculum, I did have to learn how to code. I took computer science classes, and I would also create code uh, to work with different electronic devices. Um, it's important to note that um, I didn't grow up with a, a visual impairment. So I came into accessibility and into blindness um, the hard way two years after I graduated with my electrical engineering degree. I was already working um, in software for a multinational consulting firm, and then I lost my vision suddenly. Um, so this is kind of that point in my career, you know, where it's like I've lived two lives, you know, before my disability and after my disability. Um, but this is where coding really came useful, the background that I had in, in learning how to, to program. Um, I was told, you know, even though I had an engineering degree, even though um, my resume was already, you know, filled, I was well accomplished at the time, I was told that no one would hire a blind engineer. Um, I don't want you all to be discouraged about that. This was two decades ago, and we were light years away from that time. Um, I was told that I couldn't work again, um, but I fought through it. I don't like people telling me that I can't do something. And, and I encourage you all to have that type of tenacity, you know, not just even if you're going into um, a coding curriculum, anything you do, you maintain that tenacity and you go after your passion. And eventually I ended up working for another multinational consulting firm because I lost my job um, because the people around me at that time, the people that I work with, um, within vocational rehabilitation told them I couldn't do the work. Um, well, when I was rehired again at another multinational consulting firm where I was you know, configuring software systems using code, I decided to keep my mouth shut. Um, there were a lot of enterprise tools that were not accessible with JAWS and I plowed through. I just did not want to lose another job. So I went and I made life better for myself because I, I knew how to code. So I would actually write JavaScripts to support the enterprise tools that I use 
um, that help me configure and test um, the, you know, the, the systems that not just our company employees use, but our consumers use as well. And so that's one of the ways that coding, you know, a good basic knowledge of coding and the fundamentals of coding helped me get through. It helped me solve my own problems. And unfortunately, there may be obstacles in your way with, you know, you know, within the, the, the workplace. But having being a coder and having that knowledge of how to code equips you to solving problems. And in that, you're actually a great example. You'll be a great example to the people around you because they will know then that the stereotypes about blindness and people with disabilities in general, they're mainly stereotypes, right? Um, so if I had not learned how to code in undergrad, um, that would, would have been another job that I probably would have lost because of the fact that um, at that time, you know, most, you know, IT personnel working in a corporate environment, they didn't know anything about accessibility. Um, and even with respect to my own assistive technology, like JAWS and some of the other things that I use, um, I still have to master that myself as well as code. So it's kind of a two-pronged approach, you know, being blind and in the workplace. You have to master your assistive technology, but it's also great to have that coding um, experience so that um, you're not only able to build better products uh, for generations to come because software development, it tries everything we do. And, and being able to do that, you're not only benefiting yourself and supporting yourself and solving your own problems, but you're also solving the problems that, that are with us now and that's gonna come along in the future. Um, so that's one wonderful way um, that having a background in coding um, really helped me. It helped me succeed, it helped me overcome that barrier. And ever since then, now fast forward, 2020, 2021, life is a lot better now. Now accessibility has come mainstream, has become mainstream. Companies now are focused on making their products accessible to people uh, with disabilities. Companies are now focused on providing uh, the tools internally that they give their employees, making sure that they are accessible as well. Um, so hopefully, you know, you won't have to face as deep as deep challenges that I did, but still know that, you know, a career um, in a code related field, be it engineering or computer science, um, is very rewarding. Um, so that's a little bit about what coding has done for me, how, how has benefited for me in the past. Now you fast forward to the work that I do with Verizon Media, that same background that I've had as you know, an engineer um, working on product teams and doing some coding myself, that same background, guess what, helps me relate to the developers and engineers that I work with today. So I no longer code per se. Um, I am in charge of basically native app accessibility for Verizon Media, but I do work with developers and engineers to fix accessibility defects that they find. Um, oftentimes, you know, they're not taught accessibility, you know, in the college curriculum. That's not something that's standard. So that's where I'm able to relate to them um, through my own coding experience and point them to different areas in code within the app that they need to pay more attention to. How to label buttons and icons, right? How to embed heading structure, um, how to better support um, proper cursor focus when you're swiping, when you're using either voiceover or talk back um, to, to, to swipe on your, to, to swipe across uh, the screen to get to whatever the functional tasks you're trying to accomplish. Um, so it's been benefited me right now because it makes more, it, it makes more sense to them hearing from someone like me that have actually been on product teams where they are now. Um, and so those are two really key benefits to coding. It's not only sustained me and helped me regain my professional career, 
All right. Um, it's also strengthened my problem solving skills and allowed me to solve my own problems. And, and it's also, you know, I've been able to help others, especially developers and engineers, understand how to code with inclusion in mind, right? Um, so the, and the last point that I'll wrap up with is that in this day and age, um, companies now are very focused on accessibility to the point where they're even putting in criteria and job descriptions. And this is where your experience as, you know, blind students, right, using assistive technologies, coming into a career in programming, that gives you an, a competitive advantage. It absolutely gives you your life, your unique life experience, your experience using different types of assistive technologies, web, mobile, mobile web. It brings, it brings something that other, you know, people who are sighted, those developers and engineers don't have, don't have that background experience, right? So I have to teach them that. And be that as it may, even though they're engineers, you would be amazed at what it's like to be in a training room and tell them to turn off their screens, right? And listen to talk back. You know, a lot of them freak out. But your life experience, your expertise in assistive technologies, embracing a career um, in programming will give you that, that much of a competitive advantage over everyone else because you're gonna have a set of a, a skill set that very few have in the industry. But you know, it's becoming increasingly um, important that it's needed. It's needed. So there are a few things that I want you to take away from my discussion is number one, you know, coding is very rewarding. You can use it to help solve your own problems and be more self-reliant. Uh, two, you can transform, help transform the way in which, which we work because developers, everything we do within our society is touched by code and you can help transform the way we live, work and play. Um, and three, accessibility is a cornerstone to software, good software development nowadays. And the more people are aware about assistive technologies, the more people with disabilities that use assistive technologies that go in uh, to the to programming and related fields, the better off the entire field will be. Because guess what? That means that we're gonna have more equal access to technology and that accessibility and full inclusion will be at the forefront during product development. Um, so I don't know, I may have run over time, but uh, do we have, you know, time you are questions? doing just fine. You actually have a few. Uh, the first question mm -hmm. um, says, what Android app development path is most accessible? Wow. What Android development path? That's what it says. Um, I don't really know what that means. Um, okay. There are a lot of resources like our developers. Um, we work with Google. And Google provides a lot of resources online, like the Android development kit that you can Google and look at. Um, and that'll help prepare you. You can learn about the different steps. The good thing about Android versus say iOS is that you, you have the ability to tailor, right? Because iOS is an open, uh, open, uh, I'm sorry, iOS is a closed operating system. So Android would give you a lot more freedom and exploration and you know, developing different programs. Um, and the basis for code for that is um, our developers, our Android developers, they use Kotlin, K-O-T-L-I-N, I believe is how you spell it. Um, but definitely check out and Google the Android development kit um, and look and read through those, through that information. Um, they have really, really great guides on how to start developing Android apps, and as well as um, resources on how to make sure that they're accessible. Okay, the next one. How did you teach yourself how to write JAWS scripts and what programs did you learn before you started playing around 
with JAWS scripts? Oh, wow. So <laughs> I'm much older than, you know, the person that's asking this question, I don't know. Um, way back when, you know, JAWS scripting, um, oh, gee whiz, it was, I can't remember what the language was. Um, uh, I want to say it's uh, Pascal. It was loosely, it resembled Pascal. And I know that's something that nobody, you know, nobody talks about Pascal. <laughs> um, it's one of those older programming languages. Um, but that's, that was, but because um, I basically started off learning C, once you start to learn C, a lot of the other, like the object oriented, you know, type languages, it, it starts to resemble itself, right? And so the, the key is, you know, when once you learn one, um, and I started off with C, C++, and then I did COBOL, but like I said, you know, a lot of that stuff, you know, some object oriented C uh, is, is still used, but I started coding way way back when now we have java you have javascript you have swift and kotlin on the, the mobile app side um, but it's still good to get like a basic knowledge of c and you know object oriented languages to kind of um, help guide your pathway well i want to say thank you so much for being our keynote today this has been fabulous mm -hmm. And we are going to get ready to move on to our next presentation. Mm -hmm. I will mute you so that you are muted, but please. Absolutely. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Kasaya. That was fantastic. This is Adriana Mandy. I'm the director of the California Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. Our next presenter is Ken Perry. Ken Perry has been working in access technology for 29 years and has been coding for even longer. Ken began coding in seventh grade when he got his first computer, a Commodore. Ken went on to join the Air Force as an electronics tech until returning to college to earn a degree in software engineering. Ken worked in a variety of programming experiences, including volunteering, working as a consultant for a community college, and for a disability resource center. For the last 12 years, Ken Perry has worked at the American Printing House for the Blind, he has led multiple development projects, including accessible snap circuit sets, the graffiti, braille displays, note takers, calculators, and other accessible coding learning tools. Ken continues to volunteer and continues to run an online game, a text-based game called Valhalla that he has run for the past 26 years. Ken is involved in many open source projects as he can, as many open source projects as he can find time for and is always ready to help with improving accessibility. It is my honor to introduce Ken Perry as our next presenter with his presentation, Print F. Open. Okay, sorry about that. Um, if you've already made it this far, you have passed the first test of becoming a uh, programmer and that's uh, passing the fear of my titles. Um, the whole print F and everything, I wanted to be different being a coder. Uh, I put it up as coding. This is the first thing you learn in C or C++. Even Rust looks like this, which is another programming language. But it says printf, which is a formatted print statement. And it's got my title. And it's got a backslash R and a backslash N, which means return and new line. So the whole point was to have a computer type uh, thing to start out with and see how many of you made it through that. Um, the the uh, so if you've made it to th this far, it's only going to get funner. I'm used to having somebody else run my slides, so I've kind of played around a bit with uh, PowerPoint. So I hope you guys bear with me and uh, put up with my fun, and we'll see if I ever use PowerPoint again. So let's get started. Um, I started out with a definition. Um, I'm going to use Daniel. You'll be hearing my screen reader because, you know, he sounds a lot smarter than me. So I'm going to have him read some of the slides. Um, and what this first slide is, is how do you define programming? So Glenn talked about this a little bit on his, on the uh, panel yesterday. So I'm not going to go into this deeply, but I'm going to jump down. I'm, you know, if you guys would like to put it into the chat channel, what you think programming is, I'd love to see what you guys think programming is, uh, not as a definition, but just kind of what you think programming is. Uh, and I'm going to just basically show you the Webster dictionary, which is what Glenn showed you or talked about. Um, that's my little 
uh, sound thinking. I'm going to have Glenn read the definitions. No. Yeah, okay, so the definition is simple. Uh, it's programming, uh, creating a program for a device or, and it says such as a computer, but it doesn't have to be a computer. You're all pretty much programmers already and you probably don't even know it. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Uh, you have to set functions. You have to, uh, you have conditional statements, something you can actually set. You have on and off, you have um, time. And so even as far back as when you set a very basic alarm clock, like this little Mickey Mouse clock, you had the ability to program it to actually set a time. With more complicated calendars and things, you set things like loops. For instance, if you wanted to set different alarms for Tuesday for the next three months, you would actually set that function. And while it's not programming in the word sense, I think over time, programming is becoming more and more visual. So uh, it, it's going to be come more like what you do when you set calendars. But for now, just know that you're already doing this with a coffee pot or a DVR, or if you're as old as me, maybe you had to program a VCR at one time. Go ahead and flip to the next one. And this is going to take a little music, so maybe this will wind us up. It won't be too long. a time there was a hungry alligator he loved to eat numbers so he figured out a way to always get the biggest bite when the numbers were there he would stop for a second take a look and compare whichever number was the biggest of the two was the one that he would eat so just to review here's the main All right. thing to know about the hungry alligator he always eats the number that's greater greater sorry i've got a craziness so I'm hoping the sound is over on you guys, but the um, basic reason I put that in there is it's a song kind of that does instructions on teaching you how to do greater than and less than. And as if you watch it or if you listen to it and it's um, you go through its entirety, you'll know how greater than and less than works. And so the first, my basic skills, these are skills that you can learn before you even start programming and they're skills you need to know before you program. So there's greater, uh, there's instructions. Uh, on this slide, we have step-by-step -step instructions. So following the instructions of this little cute song, you can learn how to do greater than and less than. But as a person who wants to learn to code, you're gonna have to learn, um, to do instructions, to teach instructions, to read instructions, and follow instructions. Um, the next uh, basic skill, and again, these are skills that you can learn uh, before coding, is spatial awareness. Uh, um, boy, I'm not used to all the chat. Uh, so anyways, um, the spatial awareness, um, things like laying out forms, uh, doing robotics, you need to be able to uh, know forward, backward, right, left, um, doing grid. If you want to do artwork, I've actually made visual dice as a blind person. Or uh, if you have to do some kind of uh, images, you need to be able to resize them. The next basic skill, and again, this is for people uh, even before computer skills, is alphabetization and mathematic number lines. Uh, these are really important because comparing things in programming languages are uh, something you're gonna do all the time. Uh, whether it be a word or whether it be a number, uh, it's something you're gonna have to do no matter which language you pick. Communication skills, something I failed on uh, greatly today because I ha wasn't able to use my PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> you, you really have to have good written and oral communications. I'm gonna to try to catch up. So we'll see how good I can do on these communications today. But you really need to practice uh, working with uh, your, extra, your other students, your teachers, talk to them and how to discuss things that, you know, communications is a real important thing when you're doing programming. I have math orders of precedence, even though, as Glenn said yesterday, math is not a must have for programming. Math orders of precedence is a big thing because in coding, you have to do things in a certain order. So if you're doing math, uh, you know that multiplication comes before addition. And that depends on the actual 
computer programming language because some languages will do the first expression first. Some languages will stick stuff together and do uh, the uh, two items at a time. Some you have actual real math precedents where things in parentheses go first. It, it isn't that you need to know how each programming language works. It's that you need to understand that there are precedences in different kinds of things. So um, these are my basic, basic skills that you need. But now what we're going to do is go through the skills that make you a better programmer uh, before, I mean, as you use a computer. So go ahead and switch to the next slide. Oh, uh, before I get to the, the, the skills, I wanted to show a little bit of how the basic, um, the basic um, skills help you. This is a actual bubble sort. For those of you who are sighted, there's a picture on the screen of how the bubble sort works. For those of you who aren't, I'm gonna just go down through the each step. Uh, I was going to have uh, Daniel read it, but I guess I'm going to have to read it and won't sound as smart as an English voice. But the first step is uh, in a bubble sort. The whole idea of a bubble sort is you sort every item in the list and you go through the every item in the list as many items list. So if there's 10 items, you go through the items one at a time, 10 times. So that'd be 100 different items you'd have to go through. And the simple step um, this is an English description of how to do that code, and it starts out with just start, and that might sound kind of anticlimactic because uh, you know you have to start, but the computer doesn't know that. So you, in some way, if you're doing this with a chip, you have to put the code in the right place. If you're doing it with a programming language, you have to run the right function. So the start is how you start. The step two is read the array of given items and from a user. And the user can be anything from a Bluetooth uh, signal to a file to um, a user just typing them in. So step three is take the first element and compare it to the second element, whichever is bigger. Or if it's bigger, switch it. So the, if it's bigger, you move it on down the list and you put the other one where it was. Step four is if it isn't bigger, just continue on to the next item of the list. Step six, if you re uh, repeat step three to five. So what you're going to do is you slide down through the list. If it's bigger, you move it next. If it's smaller, you leave it alone. And by the end of the first pass, you'll have the biggest number at the end of the list. And by the second pass, you'll have the second biggest at the end. And you'll do that 10 times if it's 10 items. So this is kind of, and then the last step is stop. So you have to tell it to stop. Now, the interesting thing about this is notice I wrote this all in English. Uh, it's in what they call pseudocode. It's just uh, an English list of how you would do the instructions. Some people write it out before they write a function. Some people do it in their head. Uh, if you're blind, I think you'll find you kind of figure out how you're going to do it first, and then you write it in code. So this gives you the ability to do this before you even touch a computer. Some things that uh, teachers like to do are maybe you could have an ice cream sandwich day, and you could have your students write out how to make an app ice cream sandwich. And uh, the teacher could be what I call the dumb robot. And if the student does a wrong instruction, like says, take out the ice cream and put it on the graham crackers, she could just take out the ice cream box and put it on top of the box of graham crackers. And that's the instruction. So it teaches the students kind of how a robot might think. You actually have to go through each setting. And then at the end, you could have a bowl of mess because if they don't do the instructions right, it could be very interesting for them. So learning to do correct instructions is a big skill that everybody should learn if they're gonna become a programmer. Now, let's go on to the next slide. So we got the typing going on in the background, but what this is, is my in input output slide. It's, uh, Juan talked about this yesterday in our panel, but learning to type, uh, the first bullet is keyboard, uh, braille displays, touch screens. It's very important to know how to input, uh, and the bullets under that is uh, letters, um, symbols and modifiers it's i suggest touch typing because um the faster you can type the more the better you can do as a programmer and and i'm not saying fast as in a race 
But if you have to move your hands and hunt down every key, uh, you're going to run into problems as a coder because you're going to use parentheses and, and semicolons and all kinds of symbols. Uh, Perkins is fine if you can do all your symbols, but it really helps if you can do the modifiers. And I found a lot of Braille displays don't do the modifiers right. So learning to touch type with a QWERTY keyboard will improve your skills as a programmer. Um, there's also output devices, but I put the output devices on this slide because it's really important to know things like embossers and speakers and printers. They are all important to program because you're not always going to program for a screen. So you need to learn also hardware. You need to learn how to hook things up, know what a cable is. Um, there are other kinds of, uh, as my thing says, there are other kinds of uh, output devices like motors. You're going to have to learn how to turn those on if that's what you want to do. So input and output devices are a huge part of programming. You need to learn to use your devices really well. Next slide. So I have the Jaws theme song here, but that's because I use Jaws mainly. But Jaws is not the only screen reader you use. I use, as this list says, there's every, every screen reader on this list I use, which is Jaws, NVDA, Narrator, iOS with VoiceOver, VoiceOver with Mac. I use them all. Uh, I don't use any Zoom stuff, but I have those on here too, screen magnification. If you're low vision, you're definitely going to have to use your screen reader. But the reason I have this slide on here is before you even learn to code, it is very important that you know your screen reader. I suggest you actually read the documents. I know I don't all the time, but there are tools that really, without things like touch, uh, the touch on JAWS or the search and the scan on NVDA and the scan on JAWS, there are things that you just can't access. Access, and without knowing your screen reader and knowing what they can and can't do, you won't be able to use the environments that I'm going to talk about next. Go ahead, go to the next slide. So the second thing, while you, you have to know your screen reader and you have to know it well, it's important to know your operating system. When you start programming, you always have to install libraries, you have to install um, libraries and editors, you have to um, use different parts of the operating system. You have to uh, change the environment settings. You have to know where your devices are. So it's really important to learn how to get in there and copy and download and just do anything you can with your operating system. It, it doesn't really matter which operating system you use, whether it be Mac, Linux, or Windows, but uh, notice I didn't put iOS in there. And the reason is, while it's good to learn on, if you want to be a developer, you're going to have to use a PC because there is no way currently to use any of the portable I iOS or operating systems to actually commercially build and release your software. You can actually use them for testing. You can do all kinds of things with them and, and you can definitely code for them, but it's important to know a main operating system and know it well. The more operating systems you know, as the uh, previous speaker said, the better you're going to be ready to get out in the field and do stuff. So go ahead and flip to the next slide kind of rushing through this, but um, it's really important to know your command lines too. I noticed I have two operating system screens. The first one was kind of just to talk about basic operating systems, but command line is really important for people who are blind uh, and low vision and sighted people if they actually knew it, but the, the ability to do things in the command line that you can't do with the GUI or faster than you can with the GUI is really important. Um, so we had a we had a student that had convinced their sighted teacher that the command line wasn't accessible, so he didn't know what to do with them. And after we explained to him that the command line was actually a better environment, uh, it really improved. But the real reason the student said that the command line wasn't accessible goes back to two, two or three slides ago. Um, the student didn't know how to use the screen reading software. So she couldn't review the command line, which made it difficult to use. You, if you can't see the output, then using the command line is very difficult. So it's very important that you learn to use your operating system, learn to use the command line, and 
to go back, uh, learn to use a screen reader. Next. Please help me get onto the information highway. I seem to be stuck here in my virtual driveway. Here's one of the most important things you're going to have to learn to become a coder, and that's to use the web browser. Again, notice this was mentioned in the previous talk. Uh, using, uh, being able to get out there on the web and research your own information is so important. I have a person I've been working with, a student, and I don't give all the information, and I do that intentionally because if a student trying to learn to program can't go out and find their own information, they're not going to do well in this career. You have to be able to go out and find libraries. You have to be able to find how a function works. So learning, learning something like Python might be easy, but learning how to do something with Python is a little harder. For instance, if you want to make a GUI with Python, that's a whole nother library. It doesn't really have much to do with the language. It has more to do with how the uh, library that actually makes the uh, GUI work. Uh, so you have to know how to use your web browsers. You have to know as many web browsers as you can. I have listed here Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Edge. But there are others, and you can use all the ones you want. But it's going to be important to know as many as you can, know as many screen readers as you can, and, and know them well. Go ahead and go to the next slide. There's my boxer sound. Uh, I'm not going to read all these, but I will tell you there's a whole list of editors on the screen. Um, if you want to download this uh, PowerPoint, it's going to be available, but I've got everything from Emacs to VI to IDEs, which are things like IntelliJ. These are all development environments. It really doesn't matter, as my slide down says, uh, which one should use, or I think it might, I can't remember exactly. I'm not looking at it at the moment, but um, if you want to or if you want to be a good coder you have to learn how to use an editor of some kind and it's kind of funny because that boxer bell goes to my boxer editor which i have been using since dos 5 and it's now in windows 10 it's no longer being developed which is why it's not on this list but um i've been using it that long because i like it um you need to find something you like. You need to find something that can do multiple files. You can copy. And with that, you have to have your OS. You have to know how to use your OS to be able to download and install these things. So I would say uh, download, test, delete, download, test, delete, till you find an editor that you can actually use. And I'm more than willing to help people. That's why I have my contact at the end of this. But you need to find an editor that you can use. All right, go to the next slide. So we've talked about the basic uses uh, or basic skills. Uh, we've talked about uh, operating systems. We've talked about web search and doing research. Uh, we, what, my background music's going bad there. Uh, we've talked about editors and how they can, how you need to find something that you can fit with. But the skills you need most, the ones to become a good programmer, are on this slide. And that's, you have to have, you have to be very inquisitive. Um, it's important that teachers bring out the curiosity, that students have the drive and the self-motivation to learn. You need to have self-discipline. You need to set goals that you can reach. If it's games you want to write, then set a goal to write a game. My student uh, was writing a game within a couple of weeks with Python. So it's important that you set goals. You set. Um, Hi, welcome everyone. Our next session is a panel discussion. And that topic is what does it take to get a job in coding? Our moderator today is Russell Schaefer. He's Senior Director of Global Culture, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Walmart. Then our panelists are Ng Hall, 
Director of Campus Accessibility and Student Disability Services at the University of Toledo. Heather Kennedy McKenzie is a Technology Product Manager at the American Printing House for the Blind. And Corey Joseph is a Senior Engineering Manager at CVS Health. And Corey, the floor's open to you. I'm sorry, Denise, Russell. Russell, <laughs> Russell, Russell, you're our moderator. I'm sorry, my bad. <laughs> that is okay. Uh, that is all right. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Denise said, I'm Russell Schaefer. It's a real delight to be with you all today. Good morning, good afternoon, depending upon where you're connecting from. As Denise said, I am a senior director in global culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion at Walmart, uh, but I also happen to be a member of the board for the American Printing House for the Blind. And I just want to say, uh, you know, that it's great to be a part of the National Coding Symposium uh, as moderator today. I'm so proud of APH for putting this on along with uh, uh, the California School for the Blind. I hope you've enjoyed the program thus far and will enjoy our panel. There's, there's so many wonderful speakers that I, that I know and have great respect for, Laura Allen, Jenison Assumption, Mike May, Mike Hatt, and so many others. So really hope that you are enjoying uh, the session and, and will continue to do so. Uh, as Denise said, our panel discussion for the next hour or so is around how to get a job in coding. And I will just say, uh, you know, from a framing perspective, I am not a technologist. However, I benefit greatly from technology and so does my work. As somebody who works in trying to create an inclusive environment for people of all diverse backgrounds, including people with disabilities at Walmart. I often say that technology is a barrier or a bridge to inclusion, depending upon how it's developed and deployed. And so when we think about coding for people who, with disabilities, particularly people who are blind or low vision, uh, not only are there considerations around how we code to enable and empower people with disabilities to be able to do the things that we need to do, but there's also considerations around how do people with disabilities actually do those jobs in code. So uh, as Denise said, we've got a tremendous panel with us this afternoon. Uh, we are going to largely just be talking, uh, not really any visuals, but just to give you uh, a little bit of audio description. I'm coming to you today from my home office in, in Bentonville. Arkansas. Um, I'm sitting in a small gray, uh, gray walled room with a white door behind me. Uh, and I'll um, ask that each of our panelists give a little audio description as they introduce as well. So we've got some questions that I'll just put out to each of the panelists to answer, but we'll get started by knowing a little bit more about uh, who we're talking with today, a little bit about the job that they have and the what led them to that role. So I'll just go down the line with uh, Angie, Heather, and Corey, uh, but I'll start with Angie. Maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about the, the job that you have there at the University of Toledo, what that entails, and Angie, what led you to that position? Certainly. Hello, everybody. It's a joy to be here with you. I use the pronouns she, her, hers. I am an Asian female with shoulder length hair. I'm wearing a black blazer with um, a blouse that has some flowers on it. I identify as disabled. I am a blind individual. Once upon a time, I did have some vision, so low vision, but uh, never 2020 vision. I am sitting in my office at the university. I think I have my virtual background on, but maybe not. Uh, but uh, happy to be here. So my educational background, I actually graduated from the University of Toledo, have my undergraduate degrees in speech language pathology and music, and then went on to Bowling Green State University for my graduate work in rehabilitation counseling. Also did the courses to be a licensed professional counselor in the state of Ohio. And I also have my certified rehabilitation counselor credential. And uh, I have worked in higher ed all my life, basically all my career. So I started at the Ohio State University in their disability services office, came to the University of Toledo six years ago to be the ADA compliance officer slash coordinator slash anything to do with disability. Uh, a year in our director of disability services for students 
retired. So I offered to also take on that role because I really miss the students. The students are really the favorite part of my job. I get to have the honor of watching a student grow from potentially high school or freshman, and then watching them to progress through that college experience and then move on to employment. And what a journey and what an amount of growth that we see. Um, and being somebody who's uh, visually impaired, I've always been fascinated with assistive technology. I used screen enlargement and now uh, strictly um, screen reading software, so JAWS, voiceover. And uh, I really enjoy learning about the various assistive technologies that exist. And as a director, I encourage people to utilize technology to be more autonomous, to be more independent. And when we're talking about students who are going into the STEM fields, it's really crucial that they have a lot of knowledge when it comes to how they function best in the electronic world. Also part of my job is to oversee accessibility campus-wide for electronic information technology purchases, software, and systems that we use to make sure that we purchase the most accessible software and to also troubleshoot any issues that come about. So because I am a screen reader user, I'm able to identify many of those issues and get them corrected before either our students or others in the community uh, would potentially um, file a concern with our office. I'm Heather McKenzie. Um, I am a white female. I have blonde, medium length hair. I'm wearing a purple polo and I'm coming from you from Louisville, Kentucky inside of APH. Um, my screen is blurry, but I am in my office. There's, you can barely see an orange wall, maybe a bookcase. Um, my job here at APH, I am the technology project manager for the technology product research department. And what we do here um, in my department, we um, innovate and we create apps and software and hardware and it's accessible and we take off the shelf commercial products and try to make it accessible for students and, um, and, and adults as well. Um, it's a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity. Uh, we, are, we love to play, which is what we do um, with a lot of our products because we do do a lot of stuff for education. Um, I started my career, um, I have a start, got my bachelor's from the University of Indiana University Southeast. I have a bachelor's in computer science and Spanish, and I got my graduate work in Spanish from the University of Volvo. Um, I started my career at UPS and it ended up here at the American Printing House for the Blind. I started as a programmer and now I'm a project manager. So I have a lot of careers and paths and experiences, which is great. Um, it helps me a lot with my department and I love working with the guys here. Um, so that's a little bit about me. All right, my name is Corey Joseph. Uh, I am a white male and in my background, I don't believe it's blurred. So you can probably see a dark blue chair and a shelf with various objects on it, um, including a, a drum and light and then uh, some other kind of detritus of, of living in an apartment. Uh, I went to school for information systems and international business. Uh, after finishing school and obtaining an international MBA, I promptly avoided all things software development for about three years until I started freelancing doing web development and front end development in Portland, Oregon. And after a couple years of doing that, I fell in love with user experience and more of that, that interaction development for front end. Soon after that, I was offered an opportunity uh, as someone who is a screen reader user to work on accessibility for a local startup. Fell in love with, with accessibility from the perspective of, oh, hey, I actually already know JavaScript and I already know software development and front end. I have a lot to offer here from the perspective of understanding how assistive technology actually works versus what we're building. 
uh, and shifted careers from uh, that work to be a UX engineer focusing on inclusive design and accessibility at Microsoft. Spent a little time at Amazon uh, working in their retail accessibility team. And then I uh, am now a senior engineering manager for CVS Health, uh, managing a team of folks working on accessibility for various CVS pharmacy products and services. Oh, uh, and as I mentioned, I, I am blind. And that is all our panelists. Russell? Wonderful. Uh, Corey, Heather, and Angie, thanks so much. Uh, just to uh, level set for the panel, uh, a little bit more on me for context. I am a Caucasian man in my early 40s. I am legally blind, lost my vision uh, progressively due to retinitis pigmentosa, and I utilize uh, a JAWS screen reader and uh, voice, voiceover on my uh, iOS products to help me do my day-to-day -day work. So uh, jumping into our, uh, our questions for our panelists, and maybe uh, Angie, we'll start with you, and then Heather and Corey, feel free to add on to this question. Uh, what steps can career centers take to help students who might have an interest in going into a career in coding? Yeah, I think it's important to have a conversation with the students. We want to find out what the students' strengths are and whether coding is a good fit for them. We know that each individual has their strengths and their interests. And uh, if somebody is good at, I would say, like parallel areas such as music or uh, math or the sciences, then coding could potentially also be something that would be a good path for them to take because it's the same similar type of logical thinking that it takes and it's learning the language that is involved in coding to create that product that um, is the end product that people use. Um, career centers need to uh, ensure that we are working with um, a focus on ability and not so much on limitation. So taking a look at what a person is able to do, not starting from what can you not do, but what can you do? And more importantly, how do we get it done? So we identify what it is that a student wants to do, and then how do we go about that path to get them to where they're going. So for instance, in high school, there are gonna be certain classes that are gonna lend themselves better than others. Many high schools have a high tech type of program. I know that California community colleges have a high tech program um, and high school students, at least in Ohio, can take college credit plus classes. So that means that they're able to take college credit while they're in high school. And then within each high school, there are opportunities to perhaps take programming classes or computer science classes, just so the student can get exposed to those courses to see if it's something that they're interested in continuing in. And then very importantly um, is this uh, connection that a student may have to professionals in the field. It's important for them to do informational interviews to learn about on the job what is it that somebody who uses coding does in their job? And what was their path to get to that profession? So I think that there is something to be said about mentoring and finding those blind professionals or visually impaired professionals that can help to mentor our students would be pretty crucial in that journey. Absolutely, Angie, thank you. Men mentoring so critical, regardless of the field that you go into, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, but I think in this situation, finding someone who can guide you uh, as you try to enter the field, not only from a functional perspective, uh, but also from a uh, disability perspective is really, really critical. So, you know, kind of using that as a pivot point to our next question, and maybe Corey will come to you 
uh, to see if you want to, you know, take this one first. What would you uh, say to individuals who are blind or low vision around uh, what are the challenges or opportunities that should be considered uh, when thinking about going into a career in coding? Yeah, uh, the, the, the challenges and the opportunities is, is, is a very broad question, but uh, I'll, take, I'll take a step. Uh, it's easy to get sucked into uh, in software development to get sucked into the, the latest and greatest tools and what is the, the, the best language to learn, what is going to be the, the language that, that most people are hiring for. And, and these are good questions to ask, but they shouldn't drive your interest in learning to code or, or write software. It, it should really be based in learning the concepts. What's the best language to learn the concepts of, of software development or programming uh, rather than what is the best language to learn to get hired. And then you can go from there to learn, to, to practice the, the various languages that, that use the same concepts. It's very much a world of once you know one software development language really well, and you know those concepts, it isn't a huge leap to learn another language or how to work in another tool. Uh, focus on using the, the tools that are accessible to you and the, the uh, languages that are going to be best to learn from. Um, and then from a kind of a challenge perspective, uh, it, you will encounter, especially uh, as, as folks ha have vision loss or are vision impaired, uh, you will encounter situations where the tools you, you may be recommended to use or people uh, are talking about the most may not be accessible at that time. Uh, and you'll have to find workarounds and you'll have to uh, seek out the alternatives that are accessible. It, it's going to be a part of, of the kind of environment and building your, your tool chest or your toolbox that you use day to day to learn. And then going from there, once that's really established, it'll become a matter of the resources. Uh, from an academic standpoint, this will be your classes, the demonstrations, the code samples. You'll wanna make sure that you're getting those in an accessible way. And then it'll be finding your accessible resources online to learn. Uh, Stack Exchange is a great resource, but it can also be a little hard to navigate with a screen reader. Um, and you may find uh, various coding camps and, and lessons online, and these can be challenging at times. And, it'll be a balancing act to, to find the resources that are completely usable. That's great. Heather, uh, Angie, anything you'd add on this question around challenges or opportunities for individuals uh, with vision loss and thinking about going into a career in coding? I believe Corey covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, you know, I think that to layer on to what, what Corey said, and, you know, one of the things that, like I said, I'm not a technologist, but I am a beneficiary of technology. What I do know is that code in and of itself is inherently accessible. When you boil it down to the origins of, of binary code, a series of zeros and ones, uh, you know, that is inherently accessible. It's ultimately a matter of how those things are put together and what is considered and what the universal design concepts are uh, to create an end product that is ultimately accessible or inaccessible. And so, you know, to Corey's point, uh, you know, as people who are blind or low vision, many of the products or tools uh, that you start out, you know, seeing might not be accessible themselves. And that's, I think, a lot of the reason why a number of the people that I know who are 
blind uh, who work in this space went into it in the first place is an opportunity uh, to create something that's more accessible, not only for themselves, but for, for others uh, like, them, like them, like us. And so uh, not only is there a career opportunity here, uh, but there's also an opportunity to make your career easier uh, and, and more effective um, by making a difference in, in the work that you do each day. Uh, so maybe, Heather, we'll come to you for the next question here. From your vantage point, uh, what, what can career centers do to help individuals who are looking to go into a career in coding uh, as it relates to preparing them for employment and helping them with that employment process? I think Angie covered a good number of them. Um, I think it's important to do mock interviews and to look at people's resumes as well, because resume building is another, even though it's not part of coding, but it's very important to put your skill set on a piece of paper for future employers so that, that you come across um, the way you want to. Um, also, I think a good mentor, which is a mentorship and internships. I know here in Kentucky, we offer our students at the Kentucky School for the Blind through the center. Um, summer internships for a couple of weeks, sometimes throughout the entire summer. And that gives the students an opportunity to engage with other professionals and actually figure out, is this really what I wanna do? Or they might figure out other paths within the, the field of IT that they have a lot more interest in. Um, and it gives them exposure to the tools that they would have to use as professionals in the field of computer science or just in IT in general. So um, I think that's an important thing for the career centers to also have upon, up, on top of all the courses and stuff like that. And um, I, think that, I think that'll build on really well for our students and, and adults as well. Thanks, Heather. Corey, Angie, anything you'd add? Yeah, sure, this is Angie. Um, in addition to preparing, doing mock interviews, part of that mock interview process is how do we disclose disability? How do we talk about being visually impaired or blind? Focusing on that in the first 90 seconds uh, is helpful because you can say, this is the technology that I use. This is how I accomplish the task. If not, I think that that's going to be a big question part of what we do as candidates for our jobs is to convince our employer that we are able to do the essential functions of that job, right? So when you're visually impaired, um, we can't have the expectation that employers, employers are going to necessarily be familiar with how we do things. So the more open we are to having that discussion and being able to show them, this is how I accomplish the different aspects of interacting with what needs to be done in this job. This is how I do coding. This is how I work on my computer. I'm able to, to utilize, you know, whatever suite of technology that the average person uses in the workplace. These are the workarounds that I have that um, I have discovered. Here is how I'm able to be innovative because as somebody who uses assistive technology, I'm reactionary to each piece of software that I have to learn and each piece of web um, software that I need to interact with also. And I think that that really provides a diverse perspective and it allows us to provide that inclusiveness, right? Because we are used to thinking in the world of workarounds and how do we creatively allow people to participate. Yeah, and yeah, I think you bring up such an important point around uh, disability self-disclosure, and ultimately that disclosure decision is a personal one. Uh, but I think when you think about vision loss on such a continuum, for some people, you may or may not be able to make that decision on whether or not to self-disclose, depending upon how progressive your vision loss is, whereas for others, you know, there there is no decision. You know, for me, in a pre-COVID world, for instance, I show up at an interview uh, with my white cane. There, there is no decision on whether to self-disclose or not. My white cane has given it away. 
And so from an employment perspective, an employer uh, legally cannot, you know, ask you questions around your disability, but that doesn't mean that they don't have those questions, you know, to NG's point. And so for me, I try to anticipate what might an employer be wondering about my ability to perform a job with or without a reasonable accommodation. For instance, I, I had an interview several years ago where the role required a lot of travel. And so I just expected that this hiring manager, even if they couldn't ask me, probably wondered about my ability to travel independently and what that process looked like and would I be able to do that and what the employer would need to provide me in order to be able to do that. And so without the hiring manager needing to ask me, I, I just said, hey, I understand this role re requires a lot of travel. Uh, this is... Uh, what I need. This is what I do. I travel independently a lot um, by plane and, uh, you know, this is how I get around. And, and ultimately, I got that job. I may or I may not have uh, if I wouldn't have proactively shared that information, but I knew as an interviewee that I positioned myself as best as I possibly could to get that job because I didn't leave any unanswered questions in the mind of that interviewer, even the questions that I knew and they knew they couldn't ask, but I knew were going to be there. So, you know, you've got to be your own self-advocate um, and, and anticipate that just because somebody can't ask me this doesn't mean they're not wondering. And so how do you sell yourself and, and put yourself forward in the best possible way uh, to be positioned to get that role, to get that opportunity. So, uh, you know, moving on to the next question, uh, Corey, let's uh, let's come to you. So, you know, thinking about career centers as a resource for students and for individuals who are blind or low vision, what steps can career centers take from your perspective to educate themselves around coding and what's needed uh, from a from a coding careers perspective? Perspective so that they are well positioned to be able to help support the students and clients that they serve. Yeah, and this actually is a, it's great because I had kind of my one thing I would have added to the previous question is it feeds right into this. Uh, I know for me and, and for many others uh, who are interested in careers around coding or software development, the, the number one way to learn and grow and understand what, what may be available or what paths are available is to go to community events. Uh, and, and so I think for career centers to, to know what exists in the community, what meetups are available, uh, is there a local Python group that meets regularly? Is there a JavaScript group? Is, you know, most major metro areas will have a work, a, an entire meetup dedicated to WordPress. Uh, knowing about these meetups and these events uh, and, and having them available, making the, the resources of the listings and, and where that information is stored available to the students and helping students maybe facilitate being able to go, whether that's schedules or transit or uh, going, finding another student that might want to go with them uh, is, is immensely useful. And I know that there's many of folks that I've fell into mentoring just by that nature of taking someone to an event with me. Yeah, I love that, Corey. Uh, you know, one thing that I tell um, young people a lot who are looking to get a get their first job or their career, you know, regardless of whether it's in coding or whatever the case may be, is you know, so often there's this whole I don't have the experience that I need to be able to get that job. Um, and so, in many ways, uh, you know, how do you get that first opportunity that leads to the next opportunity? And I love what you said about looking for those opportunities in the community, you know, volunteering, getting plugged in with groups, you know, doing stuff for free uh, that you want to ultimately one day get paid for. That's great resume building experience. It's also great skills building experience. And 
it shows to an employer, quite frankly, initiative and motivation that, uh, you know, I'm willing to do this. I'm so passionate about it that I'm willing to do it for free. And so, you know, finding those opportunities to plug in in the community, not only to learn and grow for the individual perspective, uh, you know, but from a career center perspective, Corey, too, like you said, I think is really, really critical because it just gives you that extra dimension, that extra opportunity as a career center advisor to say, here's some things out in the community that can supplement what you're learning, what you're getting here in your classes or in school that can help you be more prepared for the workforce, maybe even help you build that network. And, and back to the earlier point around mentorship, find those mentors who can help you uh, get, uh, get and secure that first job. And so we, one, uh, one, other, go one thing I want to add real quick is, you know, it also stacks up uh, the, 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 you know, or uh, alleviates some of the, the concerns around disclosure for the dis, for, for uh, disability, because by the nature of, of going to these events and being present and representing uh, other folks with, with disability at these events, you, you, you integrate into that community and they see, oh, okay, um, this is how a you know person who's blind uh, does interact with with these environments or with these tools or in these contexts, and then it 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 really helps to broaden that scope of okay. When I'm hiring, uh, I I know that folks you know with disabilities aren't going to have problems, and then vice versa. It's great practice for someone who has a disability to get comfortable with with representing themselves in that technical arena. And to build on what Corey was, was saying, you actually become your own advocate because a lot of people don't realize that, or who are sighted, that um, a blind developer or low vision person can do the job and how they might need to incorporate accessibility into their current products. Because I've noticed a lot of, um, it's lack of a better word, mainstream, um, accessibility is not taught in schools when it comes to the, the college courses and by them, them being exposed, it actually brings that to the forefront. So at APH, we've ha had the opportunity to do capstone projects with the local universities and have introduced the accessibility of software into um, the classroom. So that actually opens a lot and it does do some advocacy for that, to bring that back into um, the forefront as well. So it might help the student in the future because they might be able to update a tool that they didn't think of. Absolutely, great point. You know, and I think the thing to realize is that, you know, like you said, um, this isn't necessarily always a part of the mainstream. And when you start to get into the workforce in the community, depending upon the tools that you use, there's a good chance that, you know, in the general coding space, like if you use a refreshable braille display or, uh, you know, any other type of assistive technology, you might be encountering people who have never seen that before. And so, you know, part of the role around self-advocate is to educate. And, you know, it's, it's somebody who's, who's been different and does things differently and is often the, the only blind or low version person in the room. Sometimes it can be tiring to, to be that person who has to educate, um, and I get that. And so, you know, for, for those in the audience who aren't blind or low vision, you know, striking that balance between not tokenizing someone or expecting people with disabilities to always carry the weight of educating uh, is, is a balance. But, you know, for those of us who are blind, low vision, uh, you know, th that is an opportunity and, and there is that balance in that it is two way. If we want people to accept and to include us, sometimes we have to be willing to uh, entertain their curiosity and, and teach them how. And so to create that collaborative dynamic environment, it has to you know, be a two way conversation and dialogue. So as we wrap up and get ready to head into questions from the audience, uh, you know, one more for you, Angie. You know, we've, we've talked a lot about career centers, uh, you know, what at an individual level are the requirements for somebody to get services from a career center? Do they need to be a student? Do they need to be a, a DOR client? Uh, you know, what, what qualifies somebody to get support from a career center? It, um, when we're talking about career center, can you provide me a little bit of clarification? What are we referring to? Are we talking about- student like career center? 
yeah, student career centers, but also any type of other career services in the community. Uh, so there are going to be supports so and agencies that could be in place. So many states have commissions for the blind in Ohio, it's the Bureau of Services for the Visually Impaired. And so that's your rehab agency. They do have eligibility. You have to be able to benefit from services. There needs to be a barrier to um, employment and uh, that barrier needs to be associated with a disability. Um, for colleges, universities, the um, process to establish services to, so that you have access in the classroom and in campus life would be typically going through a disability resources office, accessibility resources, disability services. There's lots of different names, but they pretty much um, are going to be pointing you to the same office and this office would sit down with you talk about your experience as a disabled individual what technology you utilize what accommodations you've utilized in the past and then put access and accommodations in place so that you are able to participate and are able to show that full potential when you're in the classroom I also wanted to comment we were talking a little bit earlier uh, about um, this idea of how do we articulate the need for access. And I am a firm believer that if we make the experience of technology accessible to people with disabilities and also inclusive, that we make it a better experience for all users. Because if it's functional for us as disabled individuals, it's gonna also improve it for everybody else who's interacting with that software. Wonderful point, uh, Angie. I think we'll we'll leave it there. And uh, Denise or Leanne, I I think we've got some questions coming in from the audience. I don't know if you want to um, filter through those and, and share those out with, amongst the panelists in the time that we have remaining. Sure, Russell. This is Leanne. Your first question, and it was global to any of you. When did you make the decision or know you wanted to be involved in coding? What steps did you take in high school or what support did you get from staffs in school? So this is Heather. Um, so mine's pretty humorous. Um, I lived overseas and when I came to the US, I was sitting with my advisor at the Indiana University Southeast and they said, what do you wanna do? And I said, I wanna become a physical therapist. And they laid out the plan and I decided that nah, I didn't wanna to move to Bloomington after a year. So I started going down careers and, um, and they said, don't do um, education, psychology or nursing because there's a lot of them on campus. So I said, well, how about graphics design? And they said, we don't have that. Now they do. I said, well, how about computer science? And they were like, that sounds like a plan. So I walked into a classroom. I did not know how to code. I knew how to work a computer. I did not know how to code anything. And so my best friend became the gentleman in the back of the room that read Star Trek books and got A's. So he taught me how to code. So that's how I, I started and I haven't stopped since. Corey? Uh, I like that description. Then <laughs> your best friend became the, the, the person in the back who got A's who read Star Trek books, I love it. That's what he did. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, for me, I've always been uh, a geeky, nerdy person, and, and technology has always been something I enjoy. Uh, I have lots of stories from, from being uh, a child uh, aggravating my, my family, uh, but uh, I ended up going to school for information systems, which is very close to computer science with, with uh a little bit less calculus. Um, and then, you know, I ended up actually leaving the field of, of software development and coding because I was uh, disenchanted by the idea of working on back end uh, or, or business applications for the rest of my life. It sounded terrible. Uh, and then it wasn't until I came back and then started understanding front end and UI, user interface and 
uh, interaction, uh, the, the human computer part of, of all of this that uh, I, I really settled in and, and fell in love with it. Angie? Yeah, so I don't have a background education in technology. I am what I may want to call a tech wannabe, where I'm very fascinated by technology. Very much the end user can say the word source code and pull up source code when we're talking about HTML because of the nature of testing for accessibility for web. But that really is the extent of my technical knowledge. So what I can share here is that I've watched students who are blind and visually impaired, also with other disabilities, been able to successfully go through a computer science program with the appropriate accommodations, get on the other side and get employ employment. So for me, that's just a, a, wonderful, a wonderful process to watch how they navigate through. Nice. Corey, there's a question directly to you. What was the first programming language you learned and what workarounds have you used to share your code with other people at work? Uh, okay, I'll actually give give the hit the, a quick history because it's it's easy. Uh, my very first programming language was Pascal, which no one uses anymore. It's really really old. Uh, then Visual Basic, C plus plus, Java, then um, PHP, a little bit of Python, and then it's been JavaScript uh, and Swift uh, ever since. Oh, and workarounds. My, my biggest workarounds have been uh, really finding those resources that are accessible, finding uh, either really good video walkthroughs that are descriptive or relying on uh, friends or colleagues or teachers uh, to, to kind of fill in the gaps when I found situations where uh, the, the material I was trying to self-teach from or that was being used uh, needed some kind of additional adaptation. Uh, my, I personally use Braille quite a bit in, in actual code review and, and editing. And then, of course, I rely on, on JAWS and voiceover depending on which environment I'm in that, that day of the week. This next question, I didn't hear you name it, Corey, but I'm still learning what code languages are. Does learning PHP, Papa Hotel Papa code, could that be a good start in coding? Uh, and I actually did mention just now PHP. Uh, yes, <gasps> it's, it is um, uh, something that, that a person can learn from. I would actually not recommend it as a person's first language. It breaks uh, many of the rules around software development that you would want to consider good engineering hygiene. Uh, you would want to learn uh, from, from a more structured language. Okay. And gee, how about the next one for you? How did you get your first job? Did you apply for interviews? Did contacts suggest you? Yeah, uh, and I want to comment for about the language piece. Um, there is a related language, I guess, I think that would be helpful for um, people who are going into computer science to know, and that's LaTeX, LaTeX, L-A-T-E-X, um, because that will help tremendously as a computer science person you have to take a lot of math so knowing math language helps um, for one to get through those types of courses um, as far as jobs so i did the application process i did work with Volk rehab but the majority of what i did i did on my own so i took the initiative to do research to do searches to read about the interview process how I wanted to disclose um, the disability piece and how I could perform the functions of a job. But I think that uh, I worked as a teaching assistant when I was in graduate school, thought that might have been a phase of 
liking college students. Turns out not the case. I really do love working with college students. So I started to apply for jobs over on, on college campuses, kind of stumbled upon disability services uh, as a field because originally I had thought that I wanted to do voc rehab for the states, but we were in the midst of a hiring freeze. So I looked at dif different options and um, got hired on um, doing disability services and accommodations and access and never looked back. Anyone else want to tackle how you got your first job? This is uh, Heather. Go for it, Heather. Okay, um, I got my first job as an intern at UPS. Um, I worked part time and then got hired on full time and I got my internship through my career center at at the Indiana University Southeast. Corey. I, like I said, I, I actually ran from the career at first. I was offered a couple of internship or co-ops out of school, out of St. Louis. Uh, but then when it came time again to find work, I uh, ended up getting my first job through connections. It was truly a matter of networking and having the right conversations with enough people uh, to get myself in front of someone that was interested in, in the work I was interested in doing. Okay, I think Corey, you were the one that mentioned math. This question is algebra, a good kind of math for computer science. I'm planning to enter the field and I'm very good at algebra. Uh, yes, algebra is, is the, in computer science curriculum, you'll be required to learn higher math than algebra, but 99.99% of the math you use in programming is algebra. Well, we have actually run out of questions and we are just one minute shy or less of our end time. So I wanna say thank you to Russell for moderating and Heather, Angie and Corey for participating in the panel discussion. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to also thank um, Russell for moderating. Those were great questions and the wonderful answers. It was a great discussion with the, the panelists. I really appreciate your participation today. I hope Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. My name is Adrian Amandi. I'm the director of the Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. I'm excited to introduce our next panel. How do I turn a cool tech idea into a business? Moderating this panel is Alex Rusamano from the CEO from New Haptics, Bill McCann, the founder and president of Dancing Dots, Hans Jorgen, the founder of Be My Eyes, and Tom Pei, a co-founder of Waymap. Thank you all for being here. I know you have a lot of history beyond just the, the projects you're currently working on as well, but we appreciate your involvement today and uh, are thrilled that you're here. Alex, take it away. Thanks, Adrian. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Alex Rusimano, moderating this panel today. And uh, as Adrian mentioned, the topic is how to turn a cool tech idea into a business. And lucky for us, we have a panel of uh, all stars here <laughs> who've done just that. So um, many of you are probably familiar with the companies that our panelists today um, helped create. So we have Be My Eyes, Dancing Dots, and Waymap. Um, but for those who aren't familiar, just wanted to say uh, kind of a brief intro, and then of course I'll let them take it away. But so Be My Eyes is a, it's a free mobile app that connects blind and low vision individuals with uh, Cited volunteers and companies from all over the world through a live video call. Uh, Dancing Dots offers technology, educational resources, and training to assist blind and low vision individuals to read, write, and record their own music. And Waymap is a free app that gives audio wayfinding instructions to help blind and low vision users navigate public spaces. So obviously, uh, these are all very cool tech ideas. Uh, and that have been built into successful businesses. And I'm very much looking forward to facilitating, facilitating a discussion today 
uh, to talk about these businesses and of course these awesome individuals who've been a part of creating them and uh, really hearing about the origin stories of them because I always find that very interesting. Um, somewhat selfishly, I'm going to be fishing for some advice on entrepreneurship as a, as a new entrepreneur myself. I would love to hear uh, as much uh, you know, gems uh, uh, as I can today, so I'll be fishing for that. But I also want to leave a ton of time at the end because I know there's probably a lot of people that have questions to direct to you all and want to want to be cognizant of that and leave time for that. But to kick things off, just wanted to give time to, for everyone to introduce. I'll start because I realize I haven't done that yet. But I uh, want to kind of frame it around um, sort of what got you into entrepreneurship or your venture. And in the spirit of the coding symposium, whether uh, you have uh, coding experience yourself or whether that was part of the founding of your company uh, in, in working with code, coders and developers, which uh, I have uh, a thought that it probably was, but so. Uh, focus on that maybe. But uh, so I'll go ahead. I'm sitting here in my company kind of office slash uh, lab space here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, there's a lab bench behind me with a bunch of probably too much stuff on the surface, a bunch of electro electronic components. And I think there's a microscope in view. Uh, and there's some scribblings on a whiteboard off to my side here. But uh, I'm sitting in Ann Arbor here. I'm, I'm uh, got my PhD from the University of Michigan, which is just nearby. And as part of my research there, I helped develop a new form of tiny actuator device, which is really something similar to a pixel on a computer screen, except for instead of lighting up, it moves up and down. And so many of you might be familiar with these kinds of things in refreshable braille devices. Um, these you know move little tiny dots on to, on the surface of the device. Uh, that's kind of what I'm involved in. And so. Um, after getting my PhD, my two uh, advisors for my PhD teamed up with me and we formed a company based on the, the research. Uh, and we're now working to develop what's been referred to as the Holy Braille display, which is a, a multi-line Braille display uh, that can render uh, both graphics and multi-line Braille. And so, um, yeah, with respect to coding and working with developers, I'll just say that even though what we're working on is very hardware centric, uh, I find more and more these days that a lot of the focus is on software because that's ultimately how a user will experience our product. Uh, and so very much so I'm having to, uh, I'm not, I don't have a background in coding, but I've had to learn a ton uh, on my own to kind of get up to speed and be able to communicate with coders, developers uh, to sort of accomplish what we want to accomplish. So big coding is certainly a big part of what we do now. So, with that, uh, I would like to open it up to the panel for some introductions. I will, why don't I just kick it over to Hans, you're the next one down from me. So uh, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, there's, I have more than one reason to be happy to be here. First of all, it's a super cool company to be in. Uh, so I'm proud of that. Uh, but also uh, because I'm not a coder myself, so I will be bragging forever for, to my developers that I have been invited to speak at a uh, coding uh, symposium. Uh, so, that, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you for that. <clears throat> be My Eyes is, um, is an app, as you mentioned, and thank you for the <laughs> good introduction and, and uh, telling us what we are doing. Um, and just to, to give an example uh, is that uh, if you as a blind person, you're standing in your kitchen and you have this can of something uh, in front of you, uh, you don't know what it is, and then um, you can uh, take the, the, your smartphone and turn on the Be My Eyes app, and then you can request a volunteer. Uh, and um, most likely within 10, 15 seconds, you will have a live uh, volunteer uh, specifically for you. Uh, and we will make a live video connection uh, and the volunteer will be able to look through your camera and see what kind of uh, food ingredient you have uh, in front of you. Or you can ask, uh, have I set my oven to uh, 300 degrees? And, and, and the, the volunteer can tell you, yeah, it's almost uh, or something like that, or your uh, thermostat, or you have dropped something on the floor and, and all that. So um, that's the, the basic idea of, uh, of Be My Eyes. And 
you also mentioned that you can call a company uh, and this is super important uh, for our uh, business because that is our business uh, because it's free to use the app uh, so uh, but we have made partnership with uh, companies like google and microsoft and a number of other companies um, and uh, the point is that you can um, you can make a call to, for instance, uh, Microsoft support via Be My Eyes, uh, and they, when when you do that, they will know it's a blind person because they are calling via Be My Eyes, uh, and they also get the video part. So it's way easier for the support people to actually give support person, uh, give support to a, a blind person, um, and, and so it, it's a benefit both for them and for uh, the, the, the blind users. Uh, and, and that, of course, uh, yeah, makes the whole situation uh, more, more easy. And, and uh, Microsoft and Google and the other companies are willing to pay Be My Eyes uh, a monthly subscription. Uh, so we help them help their blind customers, so to speak. Uh, and that's why we can maintain Be My Eyes and have this uh, service uh, made free for our users uh, in 185 different uh, languages uh, across the world. Uh, we have now reached uh, 300,000 blind people and uh, more than four and a half million volunteers has signed up to, to, to do this. The reason why I came up with this idea is because I'm visually impaired myself. I have a uh, retinitis pigmentosa and uh, I have about one degree vision left. Uh, so I can just read the text on my iPhone, which I'm super happy about. Um, <clears throat> I'm using a, a screen reader more and more. Um, so, so I'm um, yeah, practically uh, going blind. Um, and uh, when I came up with this idea, uh, I was working for the Danish Blind Association. Uh, I live in Denmark. Um, and uh, I met a lot of uh, blind people, of course, doing my, my job there. and. Um, I realized that uh, a lot of them were using uh, smartphones and uh, were using uh, FaceTime and uh, Skype and so on to make calls to their friends and relatives when they needed um, a pair of eyes and they were alone. Um, and then uh, one, one of my friends said, uh, but I always have to call someone. And then I came up with this idea, ah, oh, we just make a group you can call. Uh, that cannot be that difficult. Um, and then when I got this idea, I didn't really know what to do with it. Uh, because as I mentioned, um, I have no idea how to make an app or anything. Uh, so I, I was listening to the radio and uh, in the radio, they mentioned a, a event in Denmark called Startup Weekend, where you can go and present an idea. Uh, and that's what I did. <clears throat> and uh, at this event, uh, there was uh, seven other people who thought, oh, that's a cool idea. Uh, let's look at that. And then we uh, yeah, spent the weekend uh, making kind of a, um, a, a more uh, in-depth concept of what it should do and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, one of the persons at the weekend is now the CEO of Be My Eyes. Um, and um, yeah, we, we had to raise some money and, and so on. And, <clears throat> and when we had raised the money, then we had to find some developers who could actually uh, make the app. <laughs> and um, this was in 2013. And uh, at that time, there was some apps for blind people, but not that many. Uh, there was hardly any, uh, not that many app, uh, apps at all that were using both uh, video and, and so on. Uh, so we really had to look into the uh, Danish uh, developer uh, environment to find people who were willing to uh, go into learning how to make a uh, app uh, accessible and also uh, the combination with the uh, video and uh, time zones and uh, all those languages and all that. So, but but uh, we, we did find some super cool um, that were, the, the developers that we found was uh, very intrigued of this idea about actually making a difference for someone and not only making uh, a some uh, photo sharing uh, app or something like that, uh, but something that would actually mean a difference uh, for for people. Um, and and uh, so, so we were super happy uh, 
especially when they also showed out to be capable <laughs> of actually doing it. Um, so, but, but it was a little difficult to, to find the right people uh, in the beginning. Um, and also because, uh, yeah, we, um, we didn't have a clear uh, business plan at all. Um, so we, we kind of raised the money and then uh, let's see how we could, we, we had to figure out how to make it into a business down the road. And, and that is kind of, uh, some of the developers would, would like to know, if, but do I have a job in half a year? Well, I don't know, uh, but <laughs> let's see if we can make it work. Um, and uh, yeah, but when you find the right people, uh, they make uh, things happen. And so that's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I can go on for a long time, but I think I've no, no, spent I, my time now. So. <laughs> yeah, so, you, uh, thank you very much. That was a great, great introduction. Um, I, you're, you answered some of the questions I was going to ask anyway. So uh, let's get, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, Tom, why don't you take it away? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, uh, at the age of 39, um, I was um, at the top of my uh, career in investment banking <clears throat> and I lost my sight. Um, quite suddenly, um, and um, and, I, and it really, really affected me very badly, um, it, it, uh, emotionally and um, physically. I, I just, as a human being, I, I pretty much crumbled in on myself um, uh, until I met a guy who um, who pretty much um, told me that um, I could spend the rest of my life. Uh, navel gazing or I could get out there and do something for people who were worse off than me that had never had a job like me never traveled like me and so on um, um uh, my 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 initial education is um, uh, it was a doctorate in economics and I'm an accountant so um you know pretty much I was in in that financial world and knew very little about anything else uh, but I went into the vision impairment world um, and uh, the thing that bothered me a lot about uh, vision impairment was that all of these people used to do research in, on the needs of blind people. Um, and it never told a story that, um, that, that, I, that resonated with me. Um, and um, in the beginning, I thought that was because I was unusual. But actually, I found out that most people um, uh, thought the same thing. So I carried out one of the world's largest studies into what was now known as the functionality and needs of blind and partially sighted people in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, where, we, uh, where I looked at um, many things, I wanted to find out how people were coping with life um, rather than what they needed because people need Ferraris or they need color televisions or they need some, lots of things. Um, but actually, what, what, where are the difficulties? And um, <clears throat> And, and as an odd, as an odd sort of question, I, I put in. I thought, well, I'll find out what people's mental health scores were, because when I was going through my crisis, my mental health score was not very, very good. Um, and what I found out was that a very high percentage of people who lost their sight uh, were depressed, uh, either clinically depressed, subclinically depressed, or living with anxiety. A very, very high percentage of the population. Um, and that um, uh, even where people were thought how to use a white cane or they had a guide dog or whatever, um, their, um, their, their uh, life was limited to a small number of routes. But that number of routes expanded um, almost in direct correlation to their mental health score. So the better they were feeling about life, the more routes they would do. Uh, and um, so I thought, Oh, right. Well, part of it, so it, um, when I went back and fed back to blind people, I had a lot of resistance from um, the sector itself in trying to feed back because I thought that was giving it a labor. But I fed it back and um, uh, one of the guys uh, that was with me said, I think you better stop, Tom, because there's a lot of people crying. <laughs> and uh, so I asked. Um, what had I was I upsetting people and they said no actually you're telling our story for the first time ever yeah. um, and um, and actually you know one of the great um, um, antidotes to um, to uh, depression and anxiety is actually being able to get out and walk about and um, get from one place to the other um, and be able to facilitate your your feeling of independence 
Um, but that required a, a level of confidence that was not in the, in the population. Um, so I parked that, I got a PhD for doing that, which was great. Um, and I, um, I then, I was working for a, a charity in the UK um, and um, myself and another guy who was blind, uh, uh, we, we both had kind of come together with an in, because we had an interest in buildings and transportation and regulation and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and, um, and we have been campaigning for many changes in the transport and built environment in the United Kingdom. Um, but we were reading one day about uh, an, an article in the uh, London Times that um, Tesco's, the major uh, supermarket, wanted to um, put um, RFID tags onto uh, radio. So they, these were just tags that would um, uh, uh, give let people know the price. Um, but really what it did was you could take the stuff off the shelf, put it in your shopping tray, walk through the um, a scanner. It would tell you how much you owe. You put your credit card in and walk out. And um, because they wanted to cut down the cost of people uh, in the store. And we thought, well, if we got enough bags of sugar with RFID tags on them and we wrote a program, um, we should be able to help blind people get around. Um, and we kind of did that in a little bit more sophisticated way. We engaged with the cybernetics team at Reading University and at Cambridge. Um, and we built um, probably one of the world's first um, um, uh, nav digital navigation systems for blind people. But you had to walk around with a big um, laptop, which weren't so, um, you know, which were quite heavy at the time. That was probably um, for 15, 16 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, um, and the gyroscopes that you needed were made you look like a ninja turtle. But other than that, it was absolutely cool as an academic exercise. It was brilliant. Um, we got seven blind people to navigate a very difficult part of London, including the London Underground, and came back again. Um, and I did no more with it until um, I was in a meeting. Uh, I was, became the chief executive of the Royal Society for Blind Children. I was in a, in a meeting with um, the young people. Um, and we were trying to discuss what they wanted to happen to change the world for, their be for the better. And they wanted, oddly enough, to be able to move around London underground like everybody else without sighted assistance so that they could get pushed and shoved and um, jostled like the, uh, the rest of humanity in the London Underground. And we thought, and they said to us, well, surely a gnat can do that, but like, <laughs> be my eyes. <laughs> um, I'm not a, um, an app person, um, you know, I use apps on iPhones and stuff, but um, yeah, uh, we, um, uh, I found people who knew something about apps, knew nothing about um, a lot of the difficulties that we were going to go into, but we applied to google.org um, and lo and behold, we got a million dollars of a grant from, um, from Google. And we were told to go out and change the world. Um, so we did um, experiments using Bluetooth in places like Sydney, Barcelona, Oslo, um, London, New York, California, um, uh, lots of places. And um, it all worked out really well. But um, we did a, an experiment in, um, we were doing a shopping center in Barcelona. We had to put 685 Bluetooth beacons into the shopping center in order to be able to guide a blind person around the shopping center. And I thought, um, you know, being a simpleton and a non-technical person that actually you could nuke the world if you were to put that much Bluetooth into it. Um, so, um, really what we needed to do was to be able to do this job of helping blind people to get around uh, indoors and outdoors with no signal at all. Because, you know, many times, um, you know, when you go to an underground or a subway, do you lose your phone signal? And um, so, you know, what I didn't want was you then to lose your way. <laughs> um, and I thought that that was going to be simple um, but actually it was quite difficult. So I met um, my you know, uh, co-founder and great friend, uh, Dr. Tim Murdoch. Um, and Tim um, had been working on a program um, previously 
um, to help Hans Brix find the non-existent weapons of mass destruction. Um, and uh, where um, he, he could, he walked into a building, all they had was a satellite image of the outside of the building and he walked around and if there was a hole in the middle that um, he hadn't been to when they downloaded where he was, they would see it and he'd have to go back again. Um, and I said, well, could we use that technology to project where people were going? And he said, yeah, it should be possible. Um, so we raised a, commercially a lot of money um, and we got, we got involved with um, mathematicians, uh, with coders, with um, electronic engineers, uh, you, you name it. Um, and um, we, uh, we came up with an algorithm that works indoors and outdoors on your mobile phone, just using the, um, uh, the, 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 the different devices in your phone. Um, um, and, hey Tom, um, can I, do you mind if I interrupt you just really quickly? I, I actually have questions on that front down the road and I just realized oh, okay, that, quick. no, okay. no, I, it's really, uh, it's fascinating and I, I could get more into the weeds with you probably, but I, I wanna give just enough time for some more questions down the road. I apologize okay. for interrupting, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, if you if you can, Bill, take it away and um, uh, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about Dancing Dots and the origins. And then I've got uh, a slew of questions for everyone that I'd like to get through and then we can uh, hopefully pull some questions from the audience as well. So sorry to interrupt again, Tom. Appreciate no, it, Tom. absolutely, fine, thank you. Yeah. Bill, your, your uh, mic is off, I think. Bill, your mic is off. Oh, there it is. Can you hear me now? Yep. Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. Um, I loved hearing those stories uh, from all three of you guys. Um, and so much of it sounded familiar. But I was just thinking, um, in my own history, there's there's so many parallels. And, and, and the thread that I find are a couple things. Um, the first one is the idea is really where it begins. And, you know, all of us had an idea to change something. Um, we saw things the way they are, and we said, maybe they could be different. In my case, um, I studied music, went through to, uh, to, to the degree level at a conservatory here in Philadelphia area. And I loved music and I loved Braille and I loved Braille music. And I learned Braille music when I was nine. And I quickly found out that it's really time consuming for people to make Braille scores. And most of those people are volunteers and you can't say, listen, I need this tomorrow. In fact, I'd really like to have it tonight. So long story short, by the time I finished my education as a trumpet major uh, in uh, classical and jazz, area here in Philadelphia, I couldn't get away from the idea that people were using computers to take text files and turn them into Braille. And people were using compu computers to take digital information and print up a score. So why couldn't we take that digital information and print and Braille up a score? So fast forward to 12 years after I graduated and a lot of other things that um, if we had none, I could go into, but basically I was able to start something to write a prototype of a little piece of software that took a MIDI file at that time uh, and converted it into Braille music. My business partner, Albert Milani, came along and we got some funding from the U.S. Department of Education and we were able to uh, bring that simple prototype into a product that became our first product, Goodfeel the world's first Braille music translator. But getting back to, to the audience here and the idea of coding. Um, yes, coding was a great skill for me and I, I was happy that I learned it. Uh, I should tell you that after graduating from music school and being a full-time musician for a year, I said, man, I don't wanna be this poor for this long. What can I do? And I found out about it training program that was actually based on a model from IBM. One of the IBM executives had an accident and became physically impaired and found out though, hey, I can still code. I can, I can make software. 
So all my classmates had some kind of disability and I learned to code in COBOL, um, which some of you may have heard of. And I got a job in an oil company and I was making business software. But this idea of the Braille Music Translator wouldn't leave me alone. And long story short, I was able to start up the company. But what I was struck by, the common thread and all of what you other three talked about was the idea of forming a team. And the idea that, you know, um, as especially as people with disabilities, but even if you're a uh, quote unquote non-disabled person, we're all tempted by the idea that we can do it all and we can do it all by ourselves, thank you very much. And we don't need any help and so forth. And all of you have demonstrated to me and, and resonated with my own story that the quicker you find the people to form a team, the better. Um, I did know something about coding, but I was not a coding wizard. Um, I love music. I'm passionate about music. I like programming because it gave me a good living and it connected me ultimately with the thing that um, enabled me to take the gifts I have and put them together in a way that um, j just gave me a, a great job. I mean, so many people get up out of bed in the morning and they're like, oh man, I gotta go to work again. I was like, yeah, I get to do this again. I still love what I do. And it's been 20, what, 28 years now. Mm -hmm. I love, we have customers in 52 countries. I've been to 21 of them. I've met so many wonderful people. Um, so forming the team is a big deal. Having the idea, forming the team. And then I would say, uh, the, the other thing, in forming the team, in a sense, you might say that that forces you to take a, a really good look at yourself and say, what can I do? What do I do well? What don't I do well? What do I need? And how can I fill in the gaps so that I can get from where I am to where I want to be? And that, I uh, will submit, takes a fair amount of humility. You really have be willing to say, you know, I'm not very good at whatever. For me personally, I, I, I'm good at music. I'm pretty good at coding. Um, but I've learned that I, I'm not the world's best marketing person. You know, so I have, I have services like Constant Contact, somebody else's great idea. Um, I have people who are consultants that help me. I have bookkeepers. I mean, you need help. And the, the last thing I want to say is that as blind people, we have such a great advantage if we want to found something as entrepreneurs. We have the advantage that we are by nature and by necessity risk takers. We know how to take risks. Anybody who has taken a white cane in his hand or even a guide dog and Learn how to cross a busy street is a risk taker. And if you've done that, then you have something that most people do not have. If you took your average sighted person and said, look, I want you to close your eyes and cross this four lane highway. Okay, the light's about to change, go. Who would do it? Not many people. So I will also say this, starting a business is not for everybody. And that assessment of your skills, it's a very uh, honorable and wonderful thing to work for someone else if they're doing good work and they treat you well and you, you know, you can do what you want to do. Hmm. There's nothing so, wrong with that. Um, yeah. But if you have the inclination and the personality to start a business, um, those are the things I'm thinking of. Build a team. First of all, have the idea. Build a team. Take a good look at yourself, realize what you can do well and what you can't do well, and, um, and then realize that you are a risk taker. And ultimately, it's all starting right back with that idea and to be true to that idea and really hang on to it because people yeah. discourage you, especially people who are in your, fr your, your friends, your family. Sometimes people, well-meaning people might say, you know, how in the world are you going to do that? You can't listen to that. If you made up your mind, go for it. That's it. So, so anyway, that's, that's my bit.
from today. Well, so I want to pick up a thread actually that you brought up, Bill, and then um, direct this at Hans, which is, Hans, I've heard you talk about in the past this idea um, that Be My Eyes has really had a positive impact a positive impact on not just the blind people that use the app, but also on the volunteers that are excited to uh, make a difference. And I'm fascinated by this idea of sort of micro volunteering that I've heard you talk about. Can you speak about that idea, kind of uh, define it briefly, and then um, maybe as a way of getting um, kind of uh, tying into the rest of what's going on here is, have you thought about ways in which that might be useful for um, sort of other applications, or especially in the assistive technology space or accessibility space? Uh, maybe you can give the next future entrepreneur uh, an idea to run with. So I'll let you kind of take that away. Thank you so much. And I, I can honestly say that uh, when I came up with this idea, I knew I was going blind. So I had some self-interest in, <laughs> in making this app work. And, and I, I was uh, joking uh, in the beginning, at least uh, with my uh, uh, coders, that uh, you, you better get this thing working before I need it myself. Uh, <clears throat> so that was the, the, the main driver of it. But it has been a uh, amazing experience to 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 see how uh, the volunteers are uh, really really happy about this. Uh, sometimes super super uh, small. I mean, we have many calls that are like uh, twenty seconds. Uh, have I set my oven to 300 degrees? Yes, you have. Thank you. And that's it. Uh, sometimes the volunteers get really disappointed when uh, they are almost done when, before they get started. Uh, but but I, I, I get so many uh, wonderful uh, emails from, from volunteers uh, who, uh, oh, I had a bad day, but then I got to be my asshole, and now I uh, have a wonderful day. Uh, sometimes I, I'm real doubt who am I helping the most, the blind people or the volunteers. Um, so, so it really does make a difference. Um, and I'm also uh, blessed with, um, uh, I think, Mostly on a monthly basis, someone reaches out uh, and and who has an idea and, and uh, you've got this up and, and going and how do you do that and then we can have a conversation about that. Uh, <clears throat> one, one of the one of the ideas that that I was uh, really um, happy about. Uh, I'm quite. I don't really know uh, if we got uh, it going, but it was a uh, American police person who was also a mentor uh, for some uh, young guys in, in some sort of trouble or uh, uh, on the edge of some sort of trouble. Um, but, and then he said, but we are not always there exactly when they need to talk to us. So if we could have kind of an app where they can just press a button and then someone, maybe someone in New York or San Francisco, it doesn't matter, but they have a adult uh, uh, mentor to speak to. Uh, and that, that was a great idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the, I, I don't have the capacity to take on it. And, uh, well, maybe uh, someone uh, else and, here and, does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but I was super happy to talk to this guy and I told him how I kind of got started and, and um and, and so on. So, so that uh, I have some wonderful conversations. Uh, I also sp spoke to a, a doctor in India who wanted to help uh, the blind, the not the, 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 the poor people in India, where there's uh, so few doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if they could kind of call into a and and, and, and stories like that is absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah. So yeah. And, um, mm. th thank you very much. I, I that's that's great. Um, so I was fascinated to hear all of the origin stories. I, I did a little bit of reading and poking around in different interviews you all have done in the past. But uh, one thing that comes to my mind in, in doing what, what we're doing is just sort of what sort of uh, resources and funding pathways are available for companies that are trying to operate in this space. Um, Tom, can you talk a little bit about this? I mean, I know uh, I read a little, you know, you, you all got funding from Google to uh, sort of kickstart what you're doing, but uh, do you have any thoughts on for others trying to kind of operate or, or build a business in this space? Uh, I mean, obviously, we all know it is a, a relatively small market, and so you have to be quite creative with how you're getting your product or your company idea out there. So, uh, Tom, do you, do you mind talking a little bit about that yeah. relationship you built and what other relationships were useful? 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so, um, in, in, if you're going to start a, a, an organized a tech company, started in the United Kingdom at the moment, it's it's it, it's brilliant. So, the tax system in the United Kingdom um, says that a um, an individual, um, a private individual, a taxpayer, can invest up to ten million pounds in the company. So, you could have twenty. Um, um, uh, uh, individuals putting ten million pounds in, and you, you don't. I don't need that sort of money. But um, uh, and um, they get thirty five percent of their investment back straight away from the government as a tax credit for putting it into a startup company. In addition, uh, there is no capital gains for life on the, on that particular investment, and should they die, it doesn't attract estate duties. So it's a, a it's a wonderful way of um, of doing it. Um, so, um, when I started out, uh, I, I started out with an idea that I wanted to have an app that was going to have blind people get around. Um, and I went to a guy who um, um, said, well, I, I will give you a quarter of a million pounds to get you going. Well, I'm really giving it to you. Pretty much I'm going to write it off. And, uh, you know, if I didn't have the tax allowances, um, I wouldn't do it. Because the other thing is, if you if you lose your money, then you can write uh, the balance that the tax hasn't cre- given you credit for off your income tax. So you know these you have to go to high net worth and do. Um, uh, but one of the things uh, you know that um, one of the speakers said about getting the right team around you, because what I found was that um, actually our idea didn't help blind people; it helped everybody. Um, you know, and we expanded the idea. So I started out with one story, and and as you add people to it, the story gets bigger and bigger, and changes, and it gets a life, and everybody contributes to it. Um, so the um, <clears throat> there is an, an enormous amount of money available at the moment, um, uh, uh, both in the US and in the UK, um, where um, f- uh, venture funds who normally don't fund startups. Are going into tech startups, um, and particularly tech startups with social impact attached mm. to them. Um, um, and you know you can find those um, quite easily, uh, and they are um, they are quite generous and quite lenient in the way they allow you to develop your story. So they expect that when you go in, you have an idea. But they would be very disappointed if the idea was the same one six months later. Yeah, sure. So it, it's it's allowing stuff to. So uh, yeah, it's um, you know, so it, it's really the hard graft. You've got to get stuff written down. Uh, you've got to have good sales skills. You've got to be able to convince somebody that um, even though they're going to risk their money, they're going to, you're going to give it back to them at some stage, mm-hmm. um, um, and and that they are going to get something else other than a return on their investment. Yeah, thank you very much. That that's good. Uh, helpful for me. Maybe we should, maybe we should talk, you know. Um, so, yeah, so true. Bill, for uh, kind of for future entrepreneurs out there, I think a big challenge is finding the uh, sort of the courage to take the step away from maybe a job that has a lot of certainty and good pay um, to start a business. And uh, I know you spoke in the past about your decision to transition away from sort of a stable job, if you will, to start dancing dots. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that decision and, and maybe what gave you sort of the confidence or the sort of the energy to, to make that leap and uh, whether you have any advice for future entrepreneurs out there to, to do that? Yeah, well, um, yeah, the first thing is that, um, well, let me just tell you quickly, like I said before, I decided to get a day job um, after graduating from music school. And originally my idea was to make money so I could go back to grad school. Um, I wanted to go to Eastman School of Music in New York and they were cranking out some great jazz players. They had a great jazz program, wonderful school. Um, And at the time I was told that, yeah, you can go to, we can fund you to go to grad school. That was the uh, the local rehab here in Pennsylvania. We can help you do that, but we want to spend our money in Pennsylvania on grad school. We don't want to send you up to New York. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to make my own money because that's where I want to go. Um, So I started uh, working for uh, a company, oil company called Sunoco, which 
is pretty much gone now. I think most of the assets got taken by British Petroleum or BP a while back. Um, but anyway, I started working for them and I was doing business programming and it was interesting, but it was, you know, somewhat boring work, but I kept playing at night and running a band and loving music. Um, my college sweetheart uh, decided uh, that she would accept my proposal and we would get married. But when, when we had the talk, I said, you know, I have this job and they pay me every two weeks, whether I deserve it or not, they pay me. But one of these days, I just may have to start something because I have this idea about software, music software for blind people. And she said, okay. So about five years into our marriage and number two kid coming along, I came home from work and I said, the boss said that the company's trying to get smaller and they're willing to pay us a bunch of money to leave if we volunteer to leave. So there was a lot of discussion, as you can imagine, and um, a lot of consideration, uh, a lot of prayer, a lot of agonizing. And finally, um, you know, she said, she said, I really think you need, you need to do this. If she had said, listen, Bill, you're crazy. You're the only blind guy there. After the voluntary round, when they have the involuntary layoffs, nobody's going to lay you off. They promoted you four times already. You're secure. But she said, I know you're not happy, and I know you have this idea, and I want you to do it. So again, um, getting back to the team idea, I obviously picked the right <laughs> team member. Um, but seriously, again, I also go back to what I said about risk-taking. It was a big risk. Um, nobody had done what I had done, and maybe that's because they hadn't thought about it, or maybe they knew, like, this is such a tiny little market. Why in the world would you want to do this? There are other things to do. You don't have to work that hard, and you can make more money. But um, in the end, I think it does come back to the idea that won't let you alone. I couldn't get over this idea. And I talked to guys, you guys may know, a very smart guy named David Holliday, who started a company and made Braille software for literary uh, software and Mac, Megadots, um, uh, Raised Dot Computing, I think he called his company. And David said, I talked to David in 1979. And he was like, that is a great idea. He really ought to work on that. But it didn't happen. And now I know why it didn't happen, because it wasn't something to do in your spare time. I really did have to leave my full-time gig and focus on this. So as far as fundraising, uh, the first program I heard about in Pennsylvania said, you have to be a for-profit company. And if you, if you set up for-profit, we'll give you $25,000 as a starter kind of grant. If you can match it with $25,000 from other sources and in-kind contributions. And I did that. So Looking back, maybe I should have started out as a not-for-profit because um, funds from companies like Google and foundations, they tend to just like to fund things that are not for profit, non-profit. When it comes down to it though, whether you're not-for-profit or non-profit, you have to make enough sales to keep the doors open. Um, but anyway, that's, so we went for something called Small Business Innovation Research, SBIR. Yeah. Grant, every branch of the federal government has an SBIR program. We applied and we were blessed with, to win a lot of them. And that's what kind of kept us in the game. Yeah, that's, that's actually how we got our start. So for those unfamiliar, the, um, the federal government. I just want to... Uh, Oh, Hans, go ahead. This is Adrian, you guys, not to cut you off, but uh, we do have um, about a five minute warning. We can go over a little bit, but I uh, don't want to go too far beyond our end time. Thanks, Adrian. Hans, did you have something? We'll keep it short. Um, I just want to, uh, I totally agree with Bill that uh, you need to start with uh, finding a good wife that will understand what you're doing. <laughs> you, will need, you will need that at some point. <laughs> and also, um, uh, the, the Normally, I, I, I don't give advice on, on how to do things, but 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 uh, I did exactly the same thing with, with finding a team. Um, and uh, without my team, there would not have been any Be My Eyes. Um, and it's, it's really great to have something to share 
uh, someone to share uh, the bad days with and also the good days um, and there will be some of both um, so uh, yeah for, for, for me it has been absolutely essential to, to have a team around the idea um, and um, uh, we started out as a non-profit and in the beginning it was uh, kind of easy to find the money uh, but then when you uh, are need money to pay the bills and uh, the office and so on, then suddenly it's not super interesting anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we had to, to flip to a, a for-profit company. Maybe we could have done it as a non-profit, I don't know, uh, but uh, you cannot flip too many times back and forth. <laughs> so, uh, so we flipped to a for-profit company and, uh, and, and had to find a, a real uh, business plan uh, so that we could convince some uh, investors to, to buy into. So yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. Huh? So did, did Google come to you as, as a for-profit even and that they basically made an investment? It was not a grant? No, no Google, um, Google came to us. Oh, sorry. Google came to okay. us. As, sorry, as Tom, not, as, Tom, as Tom had the role. Google experience. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Google, Google gave us a million dollars as, as a not-for-profit. So, um, okay. and what we did, we used that to build worldwide standards for audio-based navigation for blind people. Uh, through the research that we did um, and we made all of so everything that we found became publicly available to everybody else we just found a unique way of doing it um, that um, uh, you know when we brought in the right investors uh, and got the right team the idea just mushroomed and now it's a um, it's you know there's a lot of people have a lot of money in this um, so um, the pressure is on to deliver. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think Hans, you were Hans, you were saying that you all yeah. have gotten uh, um, uh, contracts with Google, though. You're saying, and that maybe that's what Bill was referring to the subscription okay. service for their Be My Eyes um, for companies. Oh, yeah. 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 So I am seeing there are questions in the chat. I, I realize we're we're running short on time, but I do notice that a lot of the questions are more more specific to the companies themselves rather than kind of general ideas. So um, I did want to leave one more question out there and one of you all can pick this up. I'll let just one of you chime in, which is, do you have any advice for a young person uh, looking to get into entrepreneurship in terms of what degrees you might recommend or kind of what areas of focus? I mean, I know Tom, you came from uh, quite a different background than what you are in now, but uh, looking back, do you have any thoughts on that? Anyone else can chime in, of course. If, if, I, if I had to do it all over again, um, uh, coding, electronic engineering, uh, mathematics, um, they're uh, massive degrees to have, and you make lots of money and you get lots of opportunities to, uh, if you've got a good imagination, to start your own business. I think that is a wonderful place to, uh, to end, considering the, uh, the coding symposium here, and we can leave the full full time for a break. I know uh, all you all would appreciate that. So uh, yeah, thank you all very much. It was, it was such a pleasure to meet you all and to chat with you all, and you all have such awesome stories that I wish we could keep going here for another couple hours, though thank I'm sure you all are busy, so. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. That was fantastic, all of you. Thank you very much. It was very inspirational. I loved hearing the courage that it took to get your company started. And the courage it continued to take to continue those companies and sounds like it, it is continuing. Um, I know a lot of our students uh, had other questions, some of them more specific. I'm hoping that you'll be open to us sending you a Google Doc or a, or a list of questions and we will then include your responses in our resources page and make sure the people who ask them know that we have answers provided. Um, again, truly appreciate it and thank you for being here today. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Adrian Amandi. I'm the director of the California Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. Along with, along with my partners in crime here at APH, we are delighted to have you back for the second day of the National Coding Symposium and the second session. Um, due to very busy schedules and some wonky moments in real life, uh, our next uh, intro to our keynote speaker and our keynote speaker will both be from a recording. Um, and we are very fortunate that these people were team players and been their life and made sure that we had these available. And prior to doing that, thank you, Margarita. Um, we're gonna share with you the opening code. So the 
opening code for this session is? It is Scala or Scala, S-C-A-L-A. -A. Great. We have put that in the chat. And Adrian, if you want to repaste that, I'll go ahead and cue our video. I'm repasting it right now. If you were here earlier and you saw the opening code scratch, don't use that. The opening code is Scala. All right. Thank you, Melanie. All right, here we go. Hi, I'm Greg Stilson, Head of Global Innovation here at the American Printing House for the Blind. Our next speaker is Laura Allen. Laura is the Head of Strategy for Accessibility and Disability Inclusion at Google. Because of her personal experience with low vision, Laura believes that technology has more power than ever before to transform lives. Laura works across uh, teams at Google to improve the accessibility and the usability of Google products. At APH, we know that people who are visually impaired, such as myself, can have exciting careers in technology. That's why we offer an ever-expanding suite of products that we like to call the road to code to help students learn to develop their programming and technology skills. But more on that later. Right now, please welcome Laura Allen. All right, let me All right. stop sharing. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Greg. Greg is also giving a presentation later this week that we are pretty excited about, um, as well as helping with some of the planning of this symposium. As I mentioned, Laura had an unforeseen circumstance that caused her not to be available today either, but she went above and beyond and recorded her uh, keynote last night to make available for us to share now. So we'll get that queued up in just one moment. Just one moment, a little glitch here, no problem. No, no problem. The beginning, <laughs> for those of you who might've missed it, we'll pop it into the chat again. The opening code is Scala, unless somebody wants to fix my coding language uh, enunciation, S-C-A-L-A -A is another, another coding language. Okay. Give me two seconds here. Not a problem. All right. Thank you again, you all. Uh, make sure that you're checking out our website for additional resources. Uh, I'll put it in the chat now, but a little bit later, I will, um, oh, I got it. I got a comment that I pronounced it right. Um, a little bit later, I will put in the chat also a resource for our coding camp that the California School for the Blind is putting on this summer. Um, our coding camp this year is unique. We always make space for out-of-state kids, but they're always the very end of the list. So if there's an opening this year, we have a coding camp available nationally um, to any student in the country. And while there are some slots just for California, there's plenty of slots for kids from all throughout the country. So um, please uh, register and encourage your kids to sign up for our coding camp. And during Laura's speech here, I will put that information in the chat. Looks like we're either, we're close to ready to go, Melanie. Are you able to see the video yet or no? I think because you're zoomed in, I'm just looking at a space on your background, hmm. I hope. Okay, well, it's not because I'm zoomed in. I shared the wrong screen with you. So just one moment, I apologize. No problem. We will, uh, let's see, no Oops, that's not it. <laughs> well, I wish I had it ready to, ready to that's plop right. in. No I'm, worries. Uh, I'm I will just get gonna roll with the, it here. You're good. Let me know when you're ready. I I'll sure keep, will. I can keep bragging about our coding camps. We um, do that. <laughs> our our summer academy program made the. Uh, we've always offered in-person summer academies. Typically, the last few years, we've offered eight academies every June. Uh, and of course, last summer we we went in the direction of everybody else and changed gears and provided them online. Um, which turned out to be fantastic. Uh, we, we did not teach a coding camp last summer for the first time in a long time. Um, we've always done a robotics and engineering. And so we've had to kind of redesign that space and figure out, well, robotics and engineering and hands-on uh, learning might be a little bit tough in a Zoom environment. And so what we've done is um, change that space to be about code itself. And we're gonna really focus on uh, uh, a tangible aspect of creating a website so that you can get that tangible feel of navigating it with your web browser um, and your screen reader or your magnifier. And it should be fantastic. And I will put that information into the chat um, 
as soon as I get a chance here about how to register and who is eligible. Melanie, do we have progress or would you like me to try it on my end? No, nope. um, we are good now, I believe. Can you see her now? I can see her now. So ladies and gentlemen, right. back to Greg's intro. This is Laura Allen uh, with Google. Um, and thankfully she was able to record her presentation and she was unable to make it today. Hi everyone, my name is Laura Allen and I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Uh, I work at Google, I've been at Google for about 11 years and my role is head of strategy for accessibility and disability inclusion. Um, and when I was asked to present today, I was asked to share a bit about my story and my path and my career and I'd love to share all of this with you. So to give you a little bit of context, my story with disability begins when I was 10 years old. So I remember very distinctly sitting one day at the piano bench and rubbing my right eye and realizing that all of a sudden, when I was looking at the sheet music in my left eye, um, I wasn't able to see the notes at all anymore. And this led us on a really long path of working to find different doctors and specialists to figure out what was going on. But I was ultimately diagnosed with a super rare visual condition um, called choroidal osteomas, and this impacts my central vision. So anything that I look directly at is largely impacted. Um, there are little flashing lights that pulse around, some distortions, some areas of darkness. Um, so basically, this happened in my left eye when I was 10, and then in my right eye when I was 14 years old in eighth grade, right before I was going to enter high school. So at that point, when I lost the vision in my right eye as well, it was this massive period of transition. And basically I went from you know, being able to use my vision to read and, and do all the different things that you typically would in school to no longer being able to read the text in a book, see the chalkboard, um, recognize my friends' faces in the hallway. So it was a period of real transition and I was working so closely with my family, with my parents and brother, as well as with my school. But my school had honestly never really worked with a student with a visual impairment before. I was the first to come through who would require uh, materials in an accessible format to listen to. So I was really, really heavily reliant on my family. I would literally come home from school in high school and my parents would read aloud to me because my books weren't available in an accessible format where I could listen to them. And I would come home and my dad would teach me my math classes because at the time, my teachers were only teaching on the chalkboard and they couldn't quite figure out what to do with a student who wasn't able to see the chalkboard. So I really think back to this time as just such a period of dependence and reliance on my family to help to bridge these gaps. And over time, over those few years, we were able to work together to figure out the right mix of assistive technologies. So I would basically follow this process where we would have my textbooks, we would strip their bindings, and then we would run all the pages through a high-speed scanner. We would use OCR software to convert the images into text, and then I would use text-to-speech software to listen to the text. And I would also use partial magnification. I would use inverted colors to, to handle the light sensitivity that I have and a large mouse cursor. So I really figured out that right mix of assistive tech to be able to regain my independence. And um, it was at that time that I really truly witnessed the power of technology. And that has sort of sparked a passion for technology ever since. So essentially, once we figured out this mix, I took that uh, that sort of method of um, stripping the bindings and then being able to, to use OCR software for all my books all the way through college. Um, I studied at Georgetown University where I studied marketing and international business as well as music. And I, I felt so lucky to be at a university where I had a really strong relationship with the disability services team for, for students where I was able to partner with them and advocate for myself um, to be able to you know, build those relationships with my professors, get my materials in accessible formats to be able to listen to them successfully, um, 
get extra time when needed on, on specific exams. I had a great relationship with them that really was defined by, you know, a, a partnership. I had to tell them my needs and they were able to help me meet my needs so that I could get the absolute most out of my education. So I was super grateful for that. And during college, um, I was introduced to an organization called Lime Connect, which is an amazing organization that basically partners with many different companies um, and tries to find ways to connect students with disabilities with these different companies looking for employment. So I would remember being at a, uh, an event in Washington, D.C., where I was able to, to hear folks from Google, from Goldman Sachs, and a few other companies talk about their disability inclusion at their company. And I have to be honest with you that I never really had thought about Google before. Um, I didn't really picture myself at Google. I, I, I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't see myself there. I didn't think about the tech sector necessarily, especially because I was studying more of the you know, marketing and international business side of things. But it was the moment when I, I heard them talking about people with disabilities at Google and finding success at Google as a person with a disability. It started to open up my eyes and open up my mind to the possibility out there. And it was at that point that I started to build a few relationships with a few key people there that I had met. And I decided to interview and it, it wound up working out. And in 2010, I moved out to California and I had a role where I started in advertising and sales. So I was working with tech B2B companies on their advertising strategies and helping to optimize their accounts and understanding about their, their needs for ad sales. And it was very interesting. Um, I definitely learned a lot in that role. I learned a lot about uh, relationships with clients and uh, customer sort of service and relationships and, and ad strategies and the dynamics of how online advertising works. But I'll put it this way, that my heart wasn't fully in that work. And I started just sort of understanding what else was going on at Google. And I started reaching out to some teams, um, thinking, just kind of giving suggestions of, hey, you know, hey, Google Docs team, I'm someone with low vision and I have some feedback for how you could make the Google Docs interface more accessible and more usable. Or, hey, Gmail team, I have some feedback. And all of a sudden, I, I was getting such a warm and welcoming reception from people saying, hey, let's grab coffee, let's, let's talk through this, I want to hear your feedback. And it was at this point that I started to realize what the field of accessibility within the tech world looked like. And back then, this was probably about nine, eight or nine years ago, it was a much smaller group of people, of course. Um, things have really spun up since then. But I started to piece together, okay, what are the different efforts going on? And what's being done by engineers versus technical program managers and so on and so on. And I was able to kind of understand the scope and I started to really um, just realize how much I loved this work. And I loved this idea of, of using my voice and the position I was in at this large company to be able to advocate for people with disabilities to make our technology more accessible. So I started thinking more and more about, you know, I, I knew years ago I had recognized the power of, of technology. And it had also become so clear to me of exactly how lucky I was in, in my story, where I had this incredible support system of my parents and my brother um, helping to sort of bridge the gaps and fill in those holes where I wasn't able to either advocate for myself if I wasn't strong enough or confident enough early on. Um, they were able to bridge the gaps when technology couldn't do that at that time. And I fully recognize that not everyone has that sort of incredible support system. It's totally like the thought that if I was born into a different family or into a different, you know, within a different country or whatever it may have been, I don't know where I'd be today. I don't know if I would have had the opportunity to overcome those hurdles in education and go to college and get into Google. So that thought really sort of fuels me as well as haunts me. It's what keeps me awake at night of, you know, this, this 
disparity in opportunity and such, such a heavy reliance on circumstance. And my main goal and my passion is around how do we use technology to help further level the playing field and create a more accessible and inclusive world for everyone. So as I was sort of falling in love with accessibility, um, I was still on the sales side and I was doing some, some side projects. We call it 20% time at Google, uh, where we're allowed to sort of uh, invest in some other work outside of our core work that just really kind of um, energizes us and, and helps us learn just totally different things. So I was working on some 20% time with different product teams, learning about things like the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and testing with different accessibility tools and technologies, learning the basics of HTML, because um, I really wanted to sort of arm myself with um, the knowledge, not having studied computer science or design formally. Um, I, of course, had perspective as somebody with a visual impairment, but I wanted to expand my knowledge in the world of accessibility. So I really dove in and I knew that I, I wanted to full find a full time role in this space. I knew that this work lit me up in a way that my other work in sales never did. So I pushed and pushed and was able to finally make it into a full-time role as a program manager uh, on the Chrome and Chrome OS accessibility team about eight or so years ago. And this role was so exciting to me because it was really heavily focused in the product space. So thinking about, you know, how do we build assistive technology tools into Chromebooks, into the Chrome browser, and so on. So building things like the Chromevox screen reader, magnification support, braille support, dictation, switch access, and so many other assistive tools. Um, it was also heavily uh, about how do we educate the broader team? So the broader set of engineers and designers and product managers and researchers and so on and so on about accessibility. Um, you know, we have a, a team of specialists with accessibility in our titles, but we need to make this something that is literally part of everyone's priorities and everyone's workflow. And that's something that, you know, we have to constantly be educating about, okay, well, not only why is this important, but how do you do it? How do you integrate accessibility best practices into what you're doing and what you're building? So that was a really important and really fun part of, of that role as well. Um, I was also at the time, I was doing a lot of other sort of projects across other teams outside of Chrome and Chrome OS, um, as well as outside of just Google. So I began doing work with some different organizations, um, one in particular being an organization called Teach Access. And Teach Access is a group that was formed about five years ago, and it brings together tech companies with universities and colleges and a few disability advocacy organizations. And the whole idea and mission behind Teach Access is how do we integrate accessibility into the curriculum of computer science, design, and other core disciplines in universities so that it's really part of the core narrative of what students are learning. So that when they graduate and they kind of join these companies and they start building and designing and developing, they can hit the ground running doing so in an accessible and inclusive way. So I'm super excited to be involved with Teach Access and we're, we're really starting to ramp up our efforts. We have so many different companies involved now from Google, to Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, uh, Verizon Media, many others, as well as many different um, colleges and universities. And of course, we're thinking about how can we continue increasing? How can we someday expand our scope internationally or expand to students younger than, than just in the college range? Um, but the whole idea is how do we get accessibility and inclusion to be part of that core story and be part of what's taught and what's baked into product development, not something that's just tacked on at the end. So it's a really exciting time in, in the realm of, of teach access and education about accessibility. So after about six and a half years on, on the Chrome and Chrome OS team and kind of helping to build the team and, and really expand and get the get buy-in from leadership that this is critical, this is important. Um, I did recently transition roles and now I sit more centrally. Um, my role now focuses more on sort of cross-organizational, cross-functional strategy for accessibility, but also for what we call disability inclusion. 
And this is really about the people side of things, not just the product side. How do we make Google a really great place to work for people with disabilities? So it's been really interesting to spend a lot of time and thought in that area as somebody with a disability um, and also somebody with what's often considered an invisible disability. I think that's also a really interesting component to think about. Um, you know, a lot of people might not know that I have a visual impairment. I don't walk with a mobility aid like a cane or a service animal at this point because my peripheral vision is still intact. So for me, it's all about how do I um, disclose and how do I explain my visual impairment properly and, and effectively? How do I let people in? And I've always kind of had to navigate that of how do I how do I tell people and when do I tell people? And I think a lot of different people are dealing with this, whether in education or in the workplace, whether it's a visual impairment or if it's anything in the realm of um, you know cognitive and neurodiversity or neurodistinction. Um, there's so many different examples of possible, you know, invisible disabilities that we need to be mindful of and very inclusive of. So I've really been enjoying this new role and it's, there's just, there's so much to still do. We've made so much progress at Google. I'm so proud of, of how far we've come, but there's so much to be done in terms of building truly accessible, usable, and delightful experiences within our products and within the broader technology industry. So I'm very excited about our future. Um, and if I could leave you with just a few things to think about, um, I would say number one is really learn how to advocate for yourself and build that muscle, that muscle of advocacy and using your voice to sort of stand up for yourself and for your needs. For me, I had to learn this over the years of, you know, asking for the things that I need um, understanding that accommodations are not a perk, they're not a burden, they're a right. So really using your voice to advocate for your needs. Second is to know that your perspective matters and you being on a team, uh, bringing your unique perspective and your un unique experience will make everything better. Like the only way that we can build truly inclusive products is to have a, a very representative group of people building them, including people with disabilities. So just know that your perspective matters and is valuable. Um, I remember, you know, as I mentioned before, I had to kind of navigate the space of how do I disclose my visual impairment and when do I disclose? And when I started working at Google, and when, especially when I was starting in the accessibility realm, I just experienced this major shift of now I could just be so open about my visual impairment because it actually gives me more credibility and I provide more value because I am somebody with a unique perspective in this space. I use assistive technology and I have, I have insights. So it's, it was such a freeing shift that now, you know, I don't have to worry about when do I disclose. I am an open book and I find that being more open and honest about my experience can actually help product teams and help people understand. So um, definitely know that your perspective matters. My third and final tip is to look for your purpose and pay attention to the things that sort of make you tick and light you up in different ways. For me, it was very, very clear when I found this mission-based work in accessibility and inclusion it just energized me in a way that I had never experienced before. And I knew that I would be so much happier if I could spend all my hours and all of my energy in this space, really working on something that I deeply, deeply cared about. And I'm not saying that this is necessarily going to be in the realm of accessibility for you, but just pay attention to those signals of the things that really light you up, really energize you, and try to find ways to fill your schedule with more of that integrate more of that into what you're learning about or what you're going to be doing in your future work. Um, it really does make a difference in overall happiness and, and overall like finding your purpose with what you're going to be doing in work. So I'm just so excited. Thank you so much for having me at this conference. Uh, we really need more creative minds in coding, in roles that support different uh, engineers and development. So again, like it's so important to think about all the different things that would be needed to build inclusive technology. So it's not just developers or programmers, it's 
absolutely the designers and the product managers and the researchers and and the test engineers there's so many different things that go into making inclusive products so um, no matter what path you're going down just just know that you'll you will make a difference and i'm so excited to see the amazing things that you all are able to build and create in the future so thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the event this week Thank you, Laura. Um, glad that we were able to get that to all of you. Uh, this is Adrienne Amandi again from the California School for the Blind. Uh, you heard from Laura that in her role working with a diverse group of people um, at Google, encouraging accessibility practices to be woven into a variety of different applications. Our next speaker works distinctly on that goal too. Sina Baram. Uh, is the founder of the inclusive design firm Prime Access Consulting. Sina is an accessibility consultant, computer scientist, researcher, speaker, and entrepreneur. He has researched and implemented ways for users with disabilities to succeed in science, technology, engineering, and math. And I am sure now that STEM has become STEAM in schools that Sina is likely creatively thinking about how he can weave success into art too. I say that jokingly to some degree, but it is just that degree of excellence, high expectations and drive that makes Sina outstanding. He leads his organization and empowers other companies and organizations to create accessible websites and mobile apps. Sina serves on and chairs a variety of boards and companies. Amongst them, he is an invited expert on the World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, Accessible Rich Internet Applications, ARIA Workgroup. You are up on the screen. If it's working for you, we see it well. Let's find out. I'm going to give it three more seconds to find its marbles. And then there we go. Um, there we go. All right, I'm good to go. Let's Fantastic. make this happen. Sorry about that. All right, let's dive in. So I'm talking today about dealing with the inaccessible. And I'll get to what I mean about that, but a couple of accessibility notes. Um, I happen to be a uh, white skinned man, uh, six feet uh, tall or so of Persian descent. I have some COVID hair that I really need to deal with once uh, uh, I get over to the barber, now the vaccinations and everything's are going, going well. And I have a closely cropped, uh, mostly well-kept uh, uh, beard. Uh, so that's a brief visual description. There's a baby grand behind me to my, to my uh, left and some windows and other things in my background as, as well. Um, and I happen to be wearing a pair of earbuds because I'm using a screen reader while I talk to you. So uh, I happen to be the president of Prime Access Consulting. I'll talk a little bit about what we do. Uh, the name of the company is PAC or PAC for short. And the website we see on the screen is www.pac.bz, PAC.bravozulu. BZ. And the reason I picked that domain name uh, was not because my company is based in Belize, which sounds lovely, uh, but because uh, it will then allow me to have my email address, Sina at pack.bz, in one line of braille on a business card. So that's the reason I wanted a short domain name for the company so I could fit the email address on, on, a, on a business card in braille. Um, so what we see here is a photo. Um, the slide is about me, and it's a a young Cena kind of leaning over a railing, right, overlooking some water um, and smiling at the camera. And, you know, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, I was born with uh, low vision, not fully blind, but I could see like some big print. And I would, uh, you know, I used to, I learned computing on something called DOS. And so I would make the text bigger on the screen and it was white letters on a black background. So as long as my nose was right up against the monitor, I could use it. You know, uh, but it wasn't the most convenient thing uh, in, in the world. And this was before I learned how to use a screen reader and, and got so much faster at computers. And so, um, you know, when I was around seven or so, I lost more of my vision. And so, therefore, I was, you know, mostly blind, uh, braille user. I travel with a cane, I use a screen reader, and, and that sort of, you know, that sort of thing. So, that's like kind of my background and my, my uh, you know, disability story, if, if you will. Will. And that really affects the lens through which 
I live my life and also the work that I do. And you know, this next slide says decisions matter, right? You can affect, you can influence how you feel. And the really key takeaway here is that you can influence, not control how you feel. We all have bad days, frustrating days, happy days, whatever the case may be, right? But we can influence a little bit of the lens of the, of the sort of personality and attitude we bring to different problems. Um, there are never going to be just all perfect days, right? But there are things we can do from a way that we think about accessibility issues, from the ways that we think about how we deal with others that can help us have a, a, a better life and also make the world a little bit better. And, and that's what I'll be talking about uh, throughout, this, throughout this talk. At the bottom of my slides, what you'll see is two things. It's uh, hashtag A11Y, so number sign A11Y, and at Sina Baram. And I'll just spell that for accessibility. So at S-I-N-A-B-A-H. R-A-M as in Mary. And that's the handle for things like Instagram or Twitter if you want to connect on there. And A11Y is a numeronym. So it stands for accessibility, right? Uh, but it's the 11, the 11 comes from the number of letters that have been removed from the hashtag. So C-C-E-S-S-I-B-I-L-I-T -S -S -I -I is missing. So it's A11Y. And that's a nice hashtag to use when you're talking about accessibility on social media platforms, because it can connect you with other people that are also passionate about it and that are also interested and knowledgeable about it. So I encourage folks uh, to, to check that out for, for sure. Um, you know, what we see here is me making a gesture on a tablet and it says go Wolfpack because my undergraduate and graduate degrees when I went to university are in computer science. And, you know, the, it was interesting. I spent a lot of time, a lot of time, trying not to be the blind guy in accessibility. There's nothing wrong with that, but I just personally didn't want to be the blind guy in accessibility. So I did everything else you could think of, uh, bioinformatics and like protein folding and stuff like that, security, right? Um, uh, you know, data visualization, like I picked the most like visual thing I could think of, you know? But all the tools I had to use and the papers I had to read and the materials I had to access and the class notes and all of that stuff was, they had a lot of accessibility issues. And I knew the computer science, I knew the programming, I knew how this stuff could be made accessible. And it was really frustrating to me that it wasn't accessible. So I studied a field called human computer interaction, which HCI for short, and it's a way of thinking about how we can make both the physical and digital worlds more accessible and more inclusive. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing, whether I'm working at the company or whether I'm working with nonprofits and things, things of that nature. I was really honored in 2012 uh, to be named one of uh, President Barack Obama's champions of change, White House champions of change. And so this really opened up a lot of doors for me. This was for some of the work I had been doing in grad school when I was getting, when I was, I was going for a PhD. Um, and this is actually how I got into museums. So you mentioned STEAM in that intro, and we do a ton of work with art museums actually, and have even invented visual description platforms so that people at museums can generate visual descriptions of artworks and of tactile reproductions of science objects and things of this nature. So that's something that's really close uh, to my heart. And this award while I was the White House is actually kind of how I got into that because I met up with some other people who said, hey, we're having this conference, come play with us on making museums more accessible. And I totally fell in love with that crowd. And it's something I spend a lot of time uh, doing. Um, my latest project in that space is I'm helping the Obama folks make the Obama Obama Presidential Center as inclusive and as accessible as it possibly can be. It's getting built in Chicago and we want it to be as welcoming and as inclusive as possible. Not just a little bit of braille here and there, not just screen readers built into the exhibits, not just visual descriptions and control over lighting and making sure there's space to maneuver if you're a wheelchair user, but all sorts of affordances, all sorts of tactics we can use to make it a really interesting and welcoming museum experience instead of a boring one where there's a bunch of stuff behind glass and there's nothing to touch and you don't have a good experience as a visitor with a disability. So people want to help, but they don't know how. 
right? And the image we see here is me uh, plummeting towards the ground. I'm skydiving. And so I'm about, oh, I don't know, uh, 10, 12,000 feet off the ground at this point, uh, uh, hurtling towards, towards planet Earth. And uh, this was a lot of fun, by the way. Skydiving is amazing. Um, and so I just, this story really sticks with me because when I went there, the folks were like, well, we've never had, you know, somebody who's blind skydive before, but, you know, happy to, happy to, to, to figure it out. How may me best help you? That was the question they asked. How may we best help you? And this question really stuck with me. This is the question that we train visitor services staff and museums on to ask, uh, you know, how can I best help? Right. And, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit. I was like, well, I'm not really in this for the view, you know, I'm blind. So can you pull a little bit later, you know, the ripcord for the, the parachute so we can get some extra diving time? He's like, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, and then we got in the plane and he's like, hey, you want to stick your feet out the uh, plane door while we're taking off? I was like, um, yes, that sounds amazing. Absolutely. So we did that, right? Um, we got up in the air and the guy I was jumping with, because you, you jump tandem your first few times. So you're hooked to somebody else who knows what they're doing. Otherwise, you know, bad things happen when you jump out of a plane and you don't know what you're doing. And so uh, he's like, hey, do you want me to dangle you out of the plane while we fly around 12, 13,000 feet above the ground and uh, let you just experience that for a little bit before we, we jump off? I was like, uh, yes, that sounds incredible. Let's definitely do that. And so they were not accessibility experts. They were not inclusive design specialists. They were not trained on these things. They simply started with a premise. How may I best help you? And that was the beginning of a conversation. And these are the kinds of conversations that we try to have in the work that we do. And the kinds of conversations that you can have with people when you experience something that's inaccessible. A lot of times it's not intentional. And so we need to meet people where they are and help educate them to make the world better, not only for us, but for everybody. That uh, skydiving place now also has an awesome experience plan for the next person who comes along who might not be able to see, right? And that's perfectly, you know, that's really awesome. So I, I thought I'd share that story just as a way of motivating having these conversations. Um, what we see here is this graffiti covered uh, subway tunnel. We see some, um, uh, the, you know, there's a, there's a drop off because it's a, it's a subway tunnel where the trains will come, right? But there's no foot braille. So, you know, those domed dots where you can tell with your cane or your foot that some stairs or a curb cut or something like that is coming off, that doesn't exist in this photo. And the reason that I, I point this out, um, is because it's inaccessibility, right? It's not always uh, intentional. Nobody went off and was like, you know what would be cool? If we made this so inaccessible that, um, you know, if you're unable to see, you wouldn't know where the drop off is. And, uh, you know, that's like, that's our goal for this project. Nobody did that, right? But because of not paying attention to certain things, because of not following certain rules, because of letting some things maybe get by when they shouldn't have at the architecture phase and the engineering phase because they didn't have, as we heard in that last talk, right, disabled members of the team working on the project as well, these things come up. And so it's easy to be upset about this sort of thing. And I'm just as guilty of that as anybody else, right? You get frustrated and you get upset about it. But we need to, we need to motivate ourselves with that frustration in order to turn that into productive action. So this next slide basically shows the contrast to that, right? It's a well-lit uh, subway uh, station, the doors are open, right? Um, and there's a yellow line of foot braille there, those domed dots I was talking about. By the way, it's like a missed opportunity. I say this half jokingly, but like it's called foot braille, but like there really should be some hidden messages that you could feel with your feet. I just think that would be really cool. Um, but you know, this is the contrast. When somebody did think about it, they did have some foot braille there, and it is a more inclusive experience. It doesn't affect, you know, parents with strollers or people with luggage or anything, but it lets somebody have that additional signal to know, hey, something's about to happen. There's stairs, there's a drop off, there's something here that you can feel, and, and that's a good thing. That's, it makes the environment more inclusive. So what we see here is this 360 degree theater, and I'll describe it. Uh, it's at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. This is a lot of the work that we do. And um, 
It has a uh, grandfather and his granddaughter sitting. Uh, he is a wheelchair user. She is not, but they're able to sit together because the seats have armrests, but some of them don't. The seats have backs, right? Uh, seat backs, but some of them don't. So this way, people of different abilities can all sit together and get up and transition. Maybe you have an oxygen tank with you. Maybe you have a guide dog and want the guide dog to sit to your side. It's an inclusive way of thinking about theater seating. There's sign language and captions for the media that's playing in this 360 degree video. There's audio description, just like there is on Netflix. And there's headphone jacks and keypads built right into the benches so that you can plug your headphones in. And even the headphone jack itself is kind of curved. It's conical, it's like a cone, so that gravity can help you drop it in. Maybe uh, your muscles in your hand uh, can't exert that much force, but you can still plug plug your headphone jack in. So there's all these different, we call them affordances. There's all these different methods and ways of making this kind of environment accessible and inclusive because it was thought about up front. It wasn't tacked on afterwards. It was thought about at the beginning of the project. And that is the most critical thing we have to encourage people to do, whether it's our friends, whether it's companies, whether it's whomever, we need to encourage people to think about inclusion at the beginning of the project not at the end of something, right? So what we see here is a universal keypad, which I think is pretty cool. This was, um, uh, it's like a game controller. So you've got up, down, left, right, and an enter key. You've got back, home, and help buttons. You can zoom in and out. There's buttons for that. There's volume buttons for up and down. And there's a button to toggle between loud audio and audio description, because somebody like me who's blind would use audio description. But my friend who has you know, uh, less than nominal hearing, right? They may need some augmented volume. So they would use this universal keypad to get louder volume from the videos that are playing in the museum. And so this keypad is another example of inclusive design because anyone can use it, but it may be critical for some people, right? Some, some folks can just use the touch screen. And those of you who are familiar with how to use voiceover on your iPhone or iPad, you can do that sort of thing too. We built in screen readers into these exhibits, but, Maybe you're unable to do that. Maybe you're not able to move your arm in that way. Maybe you don't have a right or left arm. So then how can you actuate that touchscreen in an easy way? We wanted another mechanism of, of, of doing that sort of thing. And so this is just another example of when we think about accessibility up front, it can be built into the exhibits. It can be built into the environment and make it more welcoming for everybody. So I wanted to talk a little bit about just how to advocate for accessibility, right? And there's a couple of steps I've got outlined on this, on this slide. One is to verify the problem really exists. Sometimes we, you know, we go to a YouTube video and the play button doesn't work, but maybe it's not an accessibility issue. Maybe it's just our Wi-Fi acting up or something. So it's good to verify that the problem exists, you know, have a friend check it out, for example, see if it happens on another machine, you know, another computer. But then two is contact the maker. Right, let people know, don't just be like, oh, okay, whatever. It does take a little bit of time, but I'll talk about how to do that, right? And I even have a sample like of an email we can write, right? Um, three is follow up, right? Follow up on social media, right? Mention them in a Twitter post or an Instagram post. Those things matter and use that hashtag A11Y um, uh, hashtag because that really can also uh, reinforce and get other people to contribute as well and say, yeah, yeah, that's broken for me as well. And then also encourage your friends and your colleagues and your teachers and your parents and everyone to do the same, right? Because the more folks hear about these problems, the more seriously they will take it. That's, you know, just the reality we live in. So we need to be aware of that. So how can we verify the problem, right? Try it again on your own device, right? And try to figure out what's the smallest number of steps to make it happen, right? So like, you know, do you, can you just open it up, immediately go to the button and try double tapping it? Does that, does that not work? If so, that's a nice three-step kind of process that you could quickly drop into an email or a tweet or something like that and let the company know, right? Sometimes there's a feedback or help or support button. Use those and let people know about it. It so that they can fix it. I've gotten dozens of accessibility bugs fixed this way. So it's an important mechanism to use. Um, so when you contact them, you can go to the website of like the, the person who is making the app or the 
product, a piece of hardware that you're trying to use. And sometimes they'll have an accessibility page. It's at the footer, it's at the bottom of the page. So go and find that. You could do a control F and find for accessibility. You could look for that. And, or you could do control N and you know, shift tab up from the bottom of the page and look for the link there. That accessibility page sometimes has a special email address you can contact. And those folks might be able to direct your, your complaint right to people that can can help out more and then also look for an email address or a phone number so that you can contact them and let them know of these accessibility issues so what i've got on this slide here and by the way i've shared as i mentioned these slides so you don't have to like copy it all down now but i'll just talk through it it basically is like a sample email it says hello you know my name is insert your name is my name is cena uh, i'm trying to use your I'm, I'm using a windows laptop running nvda which is a screen reader because i happen to be blind. I'm trying to use your product to do something, right? To play a video, to buy something online, to play this video game, whatever it is that you're trying to do, let them know what you're trying to do. And then most importantly, let them know what you tried to do and what you expected to happen. Well, I hit the play button and nothing happened. I double tap the play button and nothing happened. I uh, tried to log in, but I can't, the colors on the form don't let me see what fields are required because I use a magnifier and you know it's like blue on other blue, right? And so let them know what you expected to happen and why it didn't work for you. And then basically, thank them right let's end with a note of gratitude uh thank you for looking forward uh, thank you for uh, looking into this for me and i look forward to hearing back from you right very nice simple note and this structure we can work on it a little bit but it's a nice sample structure of reaching out to companies and advocating right for this accessibility issue to be fixed and um, follow up if you don't hear back so Post about it on social media. Use that A11Y hashtag, right? Maybe call if there's a phone number provided. Don't let it go and let them know that this is important. And again, going back to step number four, encourage your friends and colleagues to do the same thing. Let's make sure that we all, uh, you know, kind of group together so that they know this is a problem, not just for you, but for a lot of people. So, you know, um, I wanted to talk in just noting time here, so I'm going to go a little, uh, you know, a little quickly through this, but I did not want to leave today without encouraging everyone to check out Quorum. So Quorum is a um, programming uh, language and environment that is an accessible way of uh, programming. You can program uh, video games, you can program data visualizations, you can program all sorts of, of, of things, and it's fully accessible. The game engine is fully accessible. Um, the video games, you can do 2D and 3D. You can create your own sounds and sound effects. You can do all the things you can do in any programming language. Language, but you can do them in a fully accessible way. And you can even deploy pretty soon to things like iPhone and Android. So you can actually make an accessible iPhone app and, and do things like that. Also things like Lego robotics and you know, other sorts of uh, like manual stuff, right? Not just, not just writing code. And so it's quorumlanguage.com, Q-U-O, R-U-M-L-A-N-G-U-A-G-E.com, quorumlanguage.com. And it's a really cool community. There's a mailing list. There's all sorts of things that you can use to uh, reach out to the community. And I'm sorry that the you know, PowerPoint is just having one heck of a day, um, but uh, you know, I did share these slides and the link is in those uh, slides as well. So apologies for the, for the slides messing up. Um, but I know we have a little bit of time and if there's you know, questions I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about uh, anything or answer any questions before we have to wrap for the next uh, presenter. Wow, thank you, Sina. Um, that was incredible and motivating and a just substance of what this whole symposium is about, that the power is in the hands of these students and all of us and making a difference and encouraging accessibility. Um, I'm pretty sure most people like myself were enraptured with your presentation and staring at the screen and not thinking about our keyboard. Um, and so at the moment uh, we have, we do have somebody who said, could you please put your uh, your own URL or connection Absolutely. back into the chat? Absolutely. So that we, so. have, we have access to you because I know a lot of people were motivated and would love to reach out. Absolutely. Um, I'll put the um, uh, pack.bz uh, website 
uh, in there in the chat, and I will also uh, put in uh, my email address so that you can contact me and reach uh, out. So I'm happy, happy, happy to do that. I'm doing that right now. Fantastic. And uh, you're still sharing your screen too. Just as no the, worries. No as worries. Yeah. And um, you can see me typing into the chat and also. <laughs> perfect. You, uh, you perfectly set up our upcoming panel because Andy Stefik of UNLV <laughs> is on our next uh, panel. I'm sure he'll have a word to say about Quorum as well. Andy Stefik is one of the coolest human beings around. He's been working on digital accessibility for 10 years, deep in academia. You know, a lot of people don't know his name, but he's the reason that Quorum exists. And he is one of the, like, when I think to myself, scientist or researcher, Andy Stefik is who I envision in my brain. He's an amazing human. That is fantastic. Um, I think he's here to have heard that. And I would be amiss if he probably didn't have a similar <laughs> opinion about you, Zina. Uh, I'm very grateful that I got to know you through this process and uh, and am excited about uh, your involvement today in the future, our idea of building this out to something even bigger beyond uh, this experience. I'm very excited. We had somebody in the chat share uh, just a moment ago that they're following the symposium from Panama. Awesome. Uh, doesn't doesn't get much cooler than that. We've had people from all over Europe and Asia, um, and uh, definitely throughout the United States and Canada. Fantastic. And thank you very much. Lots lots of accolades in the in the chat. Thank you again. It's very Sarah. kind. Thank you. Absolutely. Have we a good are, rest of your event. Oh, appreciate it. Thank you, and feel free to to spot in and check it out. Anything that you can. And once thank again, you. really truly appreciate it. There is a possibility if other questions come in. That we'll send them your way and then totally the yeah. response you can give we'll put on our website yeah, thank all you all right i think we are at the uh five o'clock hour on the east coast and two o'clock on the pacific so we're ready for our next panel and the topic of this panel is how do university programs support accessible coding our moderator for the panel today is Jiyang zhou he's assistant professor or soon to be i I'll let you explain, Ju Young, uh, at iSchool at the University of Illinois. Our panelists today are Andy Stefik, Associate Professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. We have Richard Ladner, Professor Emeritus of University of Washington, and Sean Meelan, Software Developer at the SAS Institute. And Ju Young, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, so let me briefly introduce myself uh, once again. Um, so currently I'm finishing up my PhD in the learning design and technology program at Penn State uh, University, which is interdisciplinary um, study between uh, computer science and educational psychology, um, simply speaking, learning sciences. And I'm, uh, I'll be joining uh, the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign this August as an assistant professor. Um, and myself, I'm, I'm, I'm a uh, blind person. Uh, I use uh, JAWS, NVDA, and Braille, refreshable Braille display. And um, for my research, I do uh, coding, data science, machine learning, uh, et cetera. Um, and I, I'm very pleased to um, be moderating uh, today's panel. panel. Um, and I want to um, uh, give uh, more chance to uh, let our panelists introduce themselves. So what about we um, begin with um, Dr. Stefik? Uh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Andy Stefik. Everybody calls me Stefik. Uh, I live in Vegas. I'm an associate professor. Uh, I predominantly invent various kinds of technologies, uh, typically for people with disabilities, but uh, often they're usable by folks uh, uh, broadly. Um, one of the things that I invented over the years with my wife was actually the quorum programming language, which for whatever reason people started using. And uh, it's been a lot of fun maintaining that over the years. Thank you. And next, um, Dr. Ladner. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Richard Ladner. Um, I'm wearing glasses. I have white hair and a white beard and a black shirt on. And uh, my background is the is the workshop or the summit um, 
workshop uh, background. I didn't want everybody to see my basement, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Washington in the Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. I started there in 1971. So this is my 50th year at the University of Washington. And um, I've worked really closely with STEPIC for, I don't know, the last seven or eight years. Yeah. And I know uh, Sean very well. Um, and I should mention both Sean and uh, Zhu Young are, are coders themselves. Um, I'm probably not a coder. I can code, but I don't want to. I, I do other things. Uh, one of the things I do is I direct a project called Access Computing, which is um, uh, it's called a Broadening Participation Alliance in Computing. And uh, we work with students with disabilities in the United States. We have a group of about 550 students that we currently work with. Among them, uh, 86 of them are blind. Uh, and they're all either computer science majors, information school uh, majors, or maybe computer engineering majors, and a few other uh, subfields. And I was going to mention, uh, at you know, there are universities, but there's also community colleges around the nation. The community colleges have a lot of computing programs that, that lead to terminal degrees uh, after two years that, that are also coding jobs. Uh, so it's not just uh, universities, but and colleges that, that get you sort of advanced degrees in computing up to the PhD, but there's also two year degrees. Um, so go on. Uh, Young. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice um, introduction. And next, um, Dr. Millen. Yep. Hello. Um, I'm Sean Millen. I am based out of NC State University. Um, by day, I'm a programmer at SAS Institute, where I develop software that allows uh, people with visual impairments and blindness to uh, work with data visualizations. So bar charts, line graphs, uh, various types of diagrams. We make them sonifiable so that uh, people with those disabilities can also take advantage of uh, those types of things. Uh, my research background of uh, my PhD is in machine learning. Um, basically, I work with dogs that will one day hopefully become guide dogs and investigate how we can use computers to better train and evaluate those dogs. Um, my other research interests also include um, education for people with blindness in the computer science field. So how can we make computer science and other materials that you want to learn more accessible and more understandable? Thank you. Um... For this panel, I want to outline our discussion uh, um, as follows. First, I want to um, ask some questions about some prerequisites um, when it comes to um, entering um, computer science major or preparing uh, for a computer science uh, major. And second, I want to um, ask some com um, your opinions about how to um, prepare uh, in terms of um, disability services or resources, materials. And I want to um, ask some questions about uh, future opportunities after graduations or some internship opportunities. So, um, so this panel discussion is more focused on university programs um, for computer science. So I think our panelists, um, we have really fantastic panelists here because they are themselves are teachers of um, blind um, students. Uh, and um, Sean, Dr. Sean uh, Millen, he's a blind person himself and, and mm -hmm. as uh, just like me. So, um, so we can um, have a very great conversation here. So, I want to ask this question first. Uh, what comes to your mind when you um, someone asks ask you about, uh, so what is coding? What is computer science? So uh, what is your understanding of um, the background or prerequisite of computer science? Um, 
Sean, I want to ask you this question first. Uh, throwing me into the deep end first, <laughs> I see. <laughs> um, background. So I think a lot of the university programs uh, that I'm at least familiar with assume that you don't have a deep background. It, it's perfectly okay for you to come in and just as a matter of interest, go try a computer science course and decide if you like it. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to be some whiz with the computer. I know plenty of computer scientists that are not very good at using computers. They know how computers work, but you know, you don't have to be able to use every program under the sun. Um, I think the real thing is keeping an open mind and being curious about things, um, making sure that when you're talking about computer science, you relate it back to something that you're interested in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's good. Um, Dr. Ladner, I know your background is mathematics as well. Um, many people think uh, Many people um, feel um, computer science when uh, they think about computer science, that feels very intimidating because of uh, mathematics. People think mathematics um, and math is a really critical factor uh, for computer science. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, when I went into computer science from mathematics, I went into what's called theoretical computer science, which is very mathematical. So there are parts of computer science that are rely heavily on math. Uh, uh, you know, computer graphics, for example, there's a lot of linear algebra in computer graphics and so on. But, you know, the average person doesn't do graphics. The average person doesn't do theoretical computer science. I think most people will go into areas that don't require a lot of background in mathematics. I think that, you know, you know college level algebra or mm -hmm. high school algebra or pre-calculus would probably be enough. Uh, there are things that are in pre-calculus books now that talk about graph theory and trees and things like that. They call that discrete mathematics. Uh, that's some, that comes up quite a bit. But again, uh, you know, these are sort of mental concepts. They're not directly used necessarily uh, in computer programming. Mm -hmm. So um, and it's interesting you call it coding because we, we in our field, computer science field, we really don't call it coding so much. We call it programming mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know why. It's just a, a title that rings a little stronger academically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Stepik, what's your definition of computer science and what's the relationship between computer science and coding? Um, that's a good question too. So it's tricky because computer science is a lot of things. It's not, you know, oftentimes there's a misconception that what you do in computer science is you go into your room, you never talk to anyone, and then you type, 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 and then a program comes out and ta-da, you've got computer science. That's not, not really what it is. Oftentimes computer science is talking to your buddy to figure out how something should be invented. Oftentimes it's going out and talking to users. You know, I, I've spent mountains of hours talking to young children that are blind and saying, hey, what would you like to invent? Or like, hey, what do you wanna do? Or what do you like? And the thing is, is a lot of computer science is doing that kind of work. It's like working with communities. It's working with um, you know, different kinds of people and finding their needs. And there's branches of computer science. There is exactly like uh, Dr. Ladner, although I'm used to calling him Richard, but we're on a panel. So Dr. Ladner would say, it, it is true, there are areas that focus very, uh, you know, completely on one aspect of computer science. Graphics does math, data science is for solving problems. Mm -hmm. But there's other areas of computer science that are about totally different topics, like the field of human computer interaction or mm -hmm. um, other areas as well. So to me, coding is an important concept in computer science because that's how you actually invent something. But Computer science often has many things around inventing things, and both of them are really important for the field. Mm. So. Then do you think math is important and necessary for coding, Dr. Stefik? I do, but only in certain areas. So for example, um, let's suppose that you're inventing a user interface for someone to use. That's very clearly important. We all want to have our apps actually actually work. I don't really need to know any math at all to put a button on the screen and to code that up. On the other hand, if I'm controlling you know, a movie 
<laughs> and I want to have a, a lighting on a, a 3D made up object show up exactly right, then you need calculus. And so most people don't need to do that. But on the other hand, some people do. So it really depends on what area of computer science you're in. And certain kinds of math are necessary for certain areas of computer science. But that doesn't mean you can't get into computer science and do really meaningful work with, mm -hmm. you know, that you have to have differential equations. That's just not true. Even with just basic algebra or something like that, you can often do a tremendous amount of computer science, meaningful, really good work in computer science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. May I jump in real quick? Yes, please. Uh, so my background, as I mentioned, is in machine learning, which is also related to the field of data science. And you might hear a lot because it is a big growing part of computer science in general, uh, the idea of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, data science, and all of that is somewhat statistics based. So mm -hmm. being able to take a large amount of data and understand it through numbers and through statistics um, is something that you can do by it in various degrees, right? You can apply different algorithms or different sets of steps to analyze your data, or you can really understand the mathematics behind it and start digging down into it. So even in a more numeric heavy field, subfield of computer science, like data science, there are different degrees that you need to understand the math. I see, that's really great insight, thank you. So I want to ask some question about accessibility aspects. Um, so people say computer science is great, awesome, and coding, we want to learn coding, but it's not accessible. People simply say um, it's not accessible. So, but it can um, imply many things. So what's your take on it? What, what, what do you think, what are the unique challenges of computer science or coding um, that uh, students with visual impairments uh, would uh, face in terms of accessibility. Um, Sean, you go first. I would say that in general, if you're focusing more on the programming aspect of computer science, you're going to be using a computer science language that's based on text. And so that might be mm. something like Java or Python mm -hmm. or you know all these other big name languages that you can just read with a braille display or with a screen reader or with magnification. And it's not so bad. Um, I think that where people tend to run into some hurdles at first is when you're learning some of those programming concepts, you use what's called a visual language or a block-based language. Mm -hmm. um, which can be problematic, especially if you're using a screen reader, it can mm. be a little bit more difficult to work with accessibility wise, mm. but there are some great solutions to that by some of the people on this panel. Mm -hmm. So now that you mentioned block-based uh, programming language, we see many uh, great solutions out there like Scratch. Uh, Scratch is one of them, but the problem of Scratch is, is uh, requires drag and drop um, interaction, mouse interaction, which is um, often not accessible to um, blind people or screen reader users. Um, so many people um, throughout this um, event um, symposium um, mentioned Quorum programming language, which is one of the accessible programming languages. Um, so the father of Quorum um, language, language uh, Dr. Steffi, can you please um, talk a little bit about what makes Quorum um, accessible uh, compared to other uh, programming languages in terms of accessibility? Yep. So it's funny. So the, one of the very first projects that we had uh, <laughs> with uh, young children that were blind with disabilities was at the Washington State School for the Blind. And that was back in the day, some, some people on, on here might, might know some of those people. Dean Stengeham was the superintendent at the time, wonderful man, and Sherry Hahn and some other just wonderful people out there. And at, at the time, we spent a lot of time sort of like talking to kids and saying, hey, kid, what do you want to invent, right? And in programming, there's a lot of things that traditionally have not really been very accessible. And I'll give you an example. Some of them are sort of programming languages have 
difficult to understand phrases, but these are simple to solve. Like uh, to, to have a loop that does something over and over again, you might say four left paren, int i equals zero semicolon, i less than 10 semicolon, right, right paren, you know, stuff like that. And in something like quorum, you can easily fix those things by using no, phrases that are meaning. Here. Getting some feedback. So like repeat 10 times is easier to understand. And there's evidence that this is the case. This is not a subjective view, but here's the catch. When we actually talked to kids, they would often tell us, hey, I want to build a 3D game and have my buddy and I play it, you know, and they might have a friend that that, that can see and they just, they just want to do it. And at the time, I had no idea how to solve that, right? So we spent years and years trying to figure out how can we add in the things that are traditionally not accessible to kids that are blind and make it accessible. So for example, the, the current version of Quorum that's coming out, I think in like three or four weeks, actually has full on 3D programming that a blind kid can do. And they, mm -hmm. a sighted child would have drag and drop capabilities that they can look at and a blind child can do it through the keyboard and make interactions that directly connect to the code in such a way and you can use it. And so mm -hmm. a lot of what we do on Quorum isn't so much just building a programming language, it's building an infrastructure around the whole thing so that a kid can do what was traditionally very difficult in programming but now they have a fighting chance. So it might've been possible, but really hard. We're trying to make that a lot easier in theory. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, great description. Um, Dr. Ladner, the father of access computing, um, I want to ask you your insight into um, accessibility um, uh, in terms of coding. So what's your experience um, like uh, when teaching or introducing coding computational um, concept to blind or visually impaired students, what's the most um, challenge? Mm. Is it a material issue or a tutorial issue? What, 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 what do you think the most uh, challenging issue? I was thinking, you know, in terms of my Students I've worked with have had uh, blind PhD students, uh, two of them actually. And, and so it wasn't just the coding part. Uh, we talked about computer science being not just coding. Mm. There are lots of things like just reading a research paper that has figures in it. Hmm, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. So there's just a lot of barriers outside of coding. Uh, so within coding, uh, a step I can mention the bunch of them already that, uh, you know, just having all these arcane symbols like curly braces and all this, you know, it's just mm -hmm. actually annoys me because I don't think they're needed. Um, but they're kind of artifacts of the past. And, and you know, it, it makes computer scientists think that they're special to have all these special symbols or something like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's a, a barrier to actually lots of people, not just people that are blind, but people, people that are scared about this kind of stuff, uh, women, um, and other minorities just don't get into computing because it, it looks so arcane and so special. And, um, and so just removing that special stuff, which Quorum has done uh, in terms of the uh, block-based languages, uh, there's a project that was started by my student, uh, Lauren Milne, who is gonna be talking tomorrow, by the way, uh, about blocks for all. Mm -hmm. So make, how do you make block languages accessible? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I think, um, you know, part of the computer science being a, inaccessible is kind of our fault from the beginning. We made it not only inaccessible for, for blind people, but not very welcoming for lots of other groups as well that are minoritized. Thank you. Um, I understand um, Quorum is really cool language. That's really great. But I was wondering how much it's been um, used in, um, at universities. So oh. I think, uh, so yeah, let me ask this question first. So Dr. Staffig, how much um, um, uh, is quorum um, being used? That's a good question. So it's a little bit hard to tell because there's some things we track analytics for and some we don't. 
we know that per year we have about 100,000 users, which is a lot of people, right? Like that clearly mm -hmm. can't be all K through 12 blind children because that's more than the number in the United States, mm -hmm. at least according to the national data. So there's gotta be quite a, pe quite a few users that are out there that do it. And if you look on like the analytics servers that we have for Quorum, you can kind of tell snippets of where people are. Like you can find individual schools that are clearly using it for one thing or another. You can find universities that use it for various things. But a lot of times the people that use it, they don't like email me and like give me a breakdown of what they do. Hmm. So every once in a while, I'll get an email from some university in Australia or England or something. And they'll say, hey, we're doing this cool thing. What do you think? And I'll say, cool. But um, a lot of the times schools end up using it. And I really have no idea that that's what they're doing. So, hmm. um, so I can't tell you everything. I know that we're ballpark 100,000 users, which is quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't tell you exactly which groups are doing it for what purpose. It'd take a pretty significant audit to figure it out, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think Quorum is really great um, start uh, language, but I wanted to ask this question to um, Dr. Millen. Uh, what did your coursework uh, look like? So, so for your programming um, courses like Java or other programming languages, um, how much um, your coursework uh, was accessible to you? The coursework that I did during my undergrad years uh, was in some ways accessible and in some ways not accessible. And the programming aspect of it, so actually sitting down and writing uh, programming code to solve assignments isn't so bad, and that's pretty accessible. Uh, lots of good tools and mainstream tools now that are adopting accessibility best practices make it a lot easier for students to get into that aspect of it. But there are more, there's more, as we've mentioned, than just programming in computer science. There's some of the theoretical uh, things. So understanding the math and the ideas behind the algorithms that you use as a programmer is really where computer science, I, I think a lot of the meat of computer science is. And that's where you can run into accessibility problems. So a concept that's very popular in computer science and especially in computer science theory is the idea of graphs or node link diagrams. So mm -hmm. if you think of a flow chart or um, any kind of like web where you have circles and lines between the circles to show that they're somehow connected. That's called a node link diagram. And when I started, there were not very many accessible tools to allow you to work with that. Um, as part of my undergrad, I was very fortunate uh, that I had the opportunity to work with a doctor at my university, Suzanne Balick, who for her PhD was actually inventing a tool to allow blind people to work with node link diagrams. So mm. the tools exist and the tools are constantly getting better. I think there is a little bit of a tool discoverability problem in our community where somebody might have invented a tool that makes your life easier, but you might not know about it. And that's actually something, as I'm saying this, probably needs to be researched a bit more, which is the other part of computer science, which is finding those interesting problems and finding ways to answer them. Thank you. So I want to um, ask a piggyback question. Um, this is from uh, one of the audience. So the audience uh, asked, in my university, the teacher was so fast with PowerPoint, very difficult to follow. So. I think this is a common issue um, in any um, areas. So how did you address this um, visual oriented um, classes? I think the most critical part of that is to communicate with the professor. Hmm. Make sure that you're not just a face of 30, 40, 50, 100 students in the class, make sure that the professor knows your name, you have a good working relationship with them. So you can say, you know, when you say, and the red one is correct, that doesn't help me since I'm blind. So I need you to say, you know, the one with ID number two is correct or something to that effect. And having that open line of communication means that you can give them feedback on how they're doing and even get access to materials that might not be distributed to the rest of the class. So having the PowerPoint on a local computer that you can 
follow along through or even jump ahead so you can start looking at slides and trying to grasp where the lecture is going. Mm -hmm. So -hmm. communication is the key. Uh, Mm -hmm. And then finding what works for you. Because mm-hmm. everybody's experience, uh, Julian, I'm sure your experience was mm-hmm. different than mine, and our experiences are different than other people's, mm-hmm. other people with blindness or visual impairments in a similar path to ours. But finding what works for us is the most critical. Mm. To Dr. Uh, Ledner, from a um, professor's point of view, so what's your recommendation for? teaching programming uh, more accessibly. And one of the questions from audience, what is the best accessible university for programming? (laughs) Um, hmm. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know the answer to the best university for for programming. Um, You know, one, one thing you should do before you go to any university or college is you should visit there first and see what their attitude is. Uh, are they welcoming? Do they want you? And are, do they have the accommodations? You know, some universities like Stanford, I'm really, you know, I think they're fantastic and, and they really treat people with disabilities so well and, and really support them and so on. And other universities, not so much. So um, definitely do the visit and find out and visit the, the office of uh, 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 resources for disabled students and see how they're welcoming or not. Are they just are they just following the rules? And I think Sean, I see you're nodding your head. Mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> you, should... you can learn a lot by being in the same room as the people in charge of that stuff, right? right. Just having a conversation is very telling. And the, the yeah. other thing is, once you're at the university, and, and I've seen this in action, and I, I had a blind student uh, recently who was taking the intro programming class, the very first programming class. And, and so I got in the room with the teacher and the student and sort of listening in and, and maybe adding a little bit to their conversation and, and what was needed. And that particular teacher was so accommodating, so wonderful. Mm. And she had to change herself a little bit, change her style a little bit. She had to you know, have the slides ahead of time and give it to the student. She wasn't used to doing that. She did you know, sort of live programming on the screen and then she had to describe what she was doing, not just show people visually. And she was able to modify her behavior to make it much more. And having professors like that at your university that really back, you know, back you up, I think mm. is important. Mm-hmm. So don't just walk into the university on day one, mm-hmm. go there ahead of time, find out what's going on and will they be, I, I use the word welcoming. It's not just accessible, mm. but you wanna mm. have that welcoming plus accessible. Mm. Um, Professor Stefik, I want to ask your opinion as well. Are there any, any guidelines in terms of how to verbalize and how to accommodate programming, uh, how to teach programming um, more accessibly to people um, with visual impairments? Well, there are definitely some good good best practices for sure. So, what, And actually, the funny thing about uh, presentations when it comes to accessibility is that a lot of the guidelines that I that I think and others on the panel can disagree if they do, um, are sort of good practices for accessibility, or actually just kind of good practices for presentations in general. So, for example, mm-hmm. if you give a if you give a talk and you have slides on there and it has something visual, like maybe one of the charts that that mm-hmm. Sean, I'm sorry, Dr. Milan now <laughs> is talking about, it's a good idea to describe what's on the chart, audio description, if you will, mm-hmm. and it's also a good idea to kind of slow it down because sometimes those diagrams that people have, they're not just like a picture of something with a chart on it that you can instantly grasp. Oftentimes students are trying to understand some sort of deeper concept, possibly even a mathematical concept, and that might take some slow down thought and description. And that sort of audio description is a good practice just for teaching broadly, let alone if you have a student with a visual impairment. On top of that, there's also really simple things you can do. You know, when you have PowerPoint slides, there is in Microsoft PowerPoint today, there's actually accessibility checkers that actually do a pretty decent job on checking the structure of the document, on checking that you didn't forget any of the alternate descriptions of the document and things like that. And those are, those are sort of basic, but they're, they're sort of the, 
the bare bones of, of what you'd want to do. Slow it down, describe in audio, and then do the basic checking to make sure that you didn't miss anything obvious in your slides or presentations when you put it up. And we're all human. I miss stuff sometimes too when I make these, but that's, mm. I think, a good start. Mm. Dr. Steffing makes a great point there, which is describing mm -hmm. the uh, graph or whatever visual element you have mm -hmm. helps everybody because studies have shown that when various people look at the same image, they'll focus on different parts, right? The more mm -hmm. artistic people might focus on the colors first rather than the content. The other, Some other people might look at the short bars rather than the large bars. And when you stop to describe it, you can actually pull people's attention to what you're trying to show them. Mm. Uh, yeah, is... I, love that. I love that a lot. Sometimes when I teach, uh, and I know Sean, Sean is an expert at this because he does a lot of stuff with visualization and mm -hmm. trying to make that accessible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you teach complex concepts and statistics, you mm -hmm. end up with these funny charts and they have a really specific statistical meaning. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes in my own classes, when I teach that content, even though I actually haven't had a blind student in my data science courses, because they're at the PhD level, um, and we just haven't had many at my university. Um, but when I teach those, I always audio describe what the meaning of the visualization mm -hmm. is. Because mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't, even visually, I find a lot of students don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And so I, that, what Sean says really hits home with me, for sure. So. Mm -hmm. so that's really good um discussion i want to ask this question um about um ide many people many blind people are struggling um with finding a good uh, integrated uh development environment um which is accessible to screen readers like jaws or nvda voiceover so what kind of um, IDEs are there um, that could be used accessibly uh, by blind people? Um, let me ask this question to um, Dr. Millen first, because you are a developer. Yep, my day job is software development uh, in industry. I think that this is, we live in an exciting time because it seems like over the last, I don't know, five to seven years, a lot of mainstream IDEs have really woken up and taken notice to the needs of people with disabilities. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm going to take a step back and just define IDE a little bit more, which is when you're writing actual code for either an, an assignment or an application that you want to publish, you can do it in something simple like notepad or just any text editor, but they mm -hmm. don't have nice features. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't tell you what variables are, what the functions are, give you documentation as you're using things. And so these IDEs are at their core text editors, but they have so many more functions. They have, you know, uh, put your cursor on an element and press F12 and you can jump to where that element is used or defined mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. anything like that. And so looking at the mainstream IDEs, which are incredibly powerful and some are free, some are paid, um, especially the ones from Microsoft right now. So that would be Visual Studio Code, which is free mm -hmm. and Visual Studio, um, just Visual Studio, which is, they have a free version, they have a paid version for companies and things like that, but they have representatives and uh, product managers on listservs, email listservs that are dedicated for blind programmers that are actively seeking feedback about what works and what doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. what works with screen readers, what works with people with dyslexia, what works with mm -hmm. all kinds of disabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And incorporating that into the mainstream environment means that we aren't walled off from mm -hmm. what our sighted peers are doing. Mm -hmm. We now get to use the same tools as they do and get the same benefits that they do. Mm -hmm. Could you please share the listserv that you mentioned? Sure, I will make sure that that is, I, I don't remember the subscription address off the top of yeah. my head, but it's the blind programmers list. I'm sure if you Google it, you can find it, but I'll also make sure that, uh, I add it to some resources that I'm yes. sure we can publish at some point. Yes, please. That would be greatly appreciated. Sean, Sean, do you mean Program L? Is that the one? It, Program L is what I, it's called now. Yes. I think so. Yep. 
Uh, Dr. Stefik, I was told that there is a quorum studio um, which is uh, known to be accessible. Can you please uh, talk a little bit about quorum studio? Sure. So for a long time, when we first started uh, creating Quorum, as Sean, I think, uh, very well said, a lot of the mainstream sort of development environments were not very accessible at all. And so when we first started creating Quorum, we had this environment called Sodbeans. And Sodbeans basically was a hack on top of the NetBeans environment to add some accessibility features in. But it was always a hack. And mm. it was a hack because it was sort of like a band-aid on top to force it to do something accessibly more than it would. But none of us really wanted to leave that as a solution. So we asked the National Science Foundation to fund a project where we could develop our own integrated development environment. And the reason for that is because we wanted to be able to add in features that these children that I had talked to you know, 10 years ago really wanted. So they wanted to be able to do 3D game programming, 2D game programming. They wanted to be able to use drag and drop style features and things like that, but to do it accessibly. So Quorum Studio is a code environment, but it's also, it does things like scene editing. And scene editing is this idea of, if I wanna make a 2D or a 3D game, I wanna be able to have like a palette of options and like use the keyboard to embed them into a scene that can be loaded into a game without having to write any code at all. So it's sort of like, the reason they call it an integrated development environment because it integrates this concept of coding, but it also integrates debugging and editing scenes and editing graphics and stuff like that and making, in the Quorum Studios case, all of that accessible so that no matter who you are, you can participate in a meaningful sense of the word. Mm. So Quorum Studio isn't magic, it's just the tool that we use for Quorum, but it integrates anything that we've learned so far about accessibility uh, for mm. people with disabilities. Mm. Does Quorum Studio support other programming languages like Python, C, etc.? It does not. And the reason for that is because, uh, number one, it's really expensive to do that. So we, don't, we just don't have the capital to add in every other mm. language under the sun. But then number two, the, a lot of the other programming languages, they don't integrate accessibility into the core of the language. So for mm. example, suppose we use Python, right? Mm. And we added that into Quorum Studio. Well, what if a kid wanted to use the graphics libraries in Python? Are they accessible? Do we add accessibility libraries into each programming language and then that them in? Now we're talking like $30, $40 million to try to get that stuff kind of put together. I mean, it'd just be enormously expensive. So if we do it just for Quorum, the big advantage is that we build in accessibility always. Like we always do that first, right? Mm -hmm. And then if we add a new capability, we build it on top of there and we build it into one infrastructure that's always accessible and also usable by anybody. So it's really just a, a price point issue. It costs too much to do it and you know millions and millions of dollars. And in addition, like it'd be really difficult because not all the other programming languages are accessible at their core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Um, now I want to turn into um, some... Uh, opportunities so in terms of uh, internship opportunities or uh, job opportunities with the degree in computer science so dr ledner i know um you initiated really, really great um uh, access stem and um access computing network um, can you please talk about uh, what uh, the network supports and um, how people with visual, uh, students with visual impairments can be supported uh, for their internship? Sure. Um, yeah, so we're really talking about access computing, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. So we have funding to support students um, and the way we do that is that we link them up with uh, faculty members to do, for example, undergraduate research. We also uh, let them know about opportunities in industry. And for example, Google, Microsoft, uh, a lot of the big companies have uh, inclusive hiring programs where they, they tailor their hiring. In fact, they're seeking uh, people with disabilities, including blind people. And I was just listen a little bit earlier, listening to Laura Allen and her story. Uh, about joining Google and and you know uh, Google is one of those companies that really wants to hire people with disabilities. One of the first mm -hmm. blind students I ever worked with is Nicole Torcalini. Mm -hmm. uh, 
when I actually worked with her when she was in high school. And eventually she went to Stanford and that's why I have such a high uh, positive feeling about Stanford was her experience there. And, and then she moved to Google. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, th th there are pathways. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize though that, you know, that's sort of like, you know, if you're like the very high road, uh, getting a computer science degree or computer engineering degree or data science degree, and then working for a big company or maybe even going to grad school, all that. But there are, as I mentioned earlier, you know, more, I would say technical degrees that are two-year degrees that mm. you can find at community colleges. And so don't just think, oh, I, you know, to do computer science, I have to, I have to get a four-year degree. Mm. You don't. Mm. Now there are, you know, these boot camps and things like that. Mm -hmm. and I've never heard of a boot camp as very accessible. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when you go to a boot camp, you kind of have to be primed and have that kind of like, I don't know, computer science mentality before you even go if you're going to be successful. Mm. It's not something where you can just turn your life around. Mm. So you definitely want to get a two-year or four-year degree. And if you can, like uh, both Sean and Ju Young, go on for a PhD, my goodness. Uh, two blind PhDs on the same panel with Stefik and me. This is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Thank you for sharing um, the insight. Uh, Sean, I want to ask um, about your opinion. Um, our previous presenter, Sheen, uh, Sina, he mentioned that um, even though he wanted to try uh, with other non-accessibility um, disciplines, so there are many inaccessible um, areas. Um, I was wondering how, uh, what um, your internship uh, exploration, uh, exploration looked like. Um, how did you secure your internship? I know you did your internship at um, SAS um, Institute, mm -hmm. um, maybe two times. So can you please share your story Sure. Uh, so my first internship was actually when I was an undergrad, um, and it was a small company that does website development for bigger companies, basically just that wanted to outsource their web development so they didn't have to hire uh, web developers. So my first internship was just doing kind of standard web programming, putting text up, creating uh, forms, creating things like that, interactive elements. Uh, that was when I was an undergrad. And then my first kind of, I, I would say, closer to my interest internship was at Toshiba Global Commerce Solutions, mm -hmm. which is a company that does a lot of point of sales terminals and equipment for stores. So things like Walmart and whatever other big real real retailers that use those kinds of things. So that was a, a very eye-opening kind of experience for me because at that point I was in a much larger company. I was dealing with code that was significantly more robust and uh, enterprise quality. And then a few years down the line, I was hired at SAS Institute as an intern on the accessibility team, but I was applying the, my skills that I picked up during my PhD, which mm. is not in accessibility. It's actually in, as I mentioned before, uh, mm -hmm. working with dogs and computers, applying machine learning to accessibility and mm. some internal projects that had to do with looking at images of graphs and taking that data and doing stuff with it. Um, it was only in the last couple of years that I shifted more to a data visualization and that kind of concept working with uh, charts and maps and things like that, that now you can are publicly available for people to use. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we had really great um, and productive uh, discussion. Um, I think we are running um, out of time. Maybe we have to conclude our um, panel, but I want to ask uh, if you had any last comment you want to share to the audience uh, with the audience. Um, Dr. Stefik, you go first. Uh, sure. You, well, yeah. 
my last comment is I want to congratulate both of you on completing your PhDs because I knew you back when you didn't have one. So that's all I want to say. But <laughs> Thank th you. thanks a lot for the panel and thanks for both of you. You guys are, you and Sean, Julian and Sean are both awesome and you both deserve the PhDs and I think you guys can kick some butt. So I hope you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lenner. You're muted, Richard. Uh, I'll ditto what Stephanie just said about uh, both Sean and jo Joanne. Um, I, I wanted to add one more thing, and this would be more for parents and maybe younger people, that there is this big movement in the United States going on called the Computer Science for All movement. And this is getting computer science into K through 12 education. So most of what we talked about was the universities and things like that today, but um, uh, sort of making that K through 12 computer science accessible is a, a major challenge. And both Stefik and I are working on that personally, and we would like more people to get into that as well. So uh, think about, you know, we talked about the block-based languages not being accessible, but that's the first introduction to computing that's by, by most children in the world, actually. Um, so there is quite a bit to do in that, in that space. Mm -hmm. So good luck to you all out there. Thank you. Last but not least, Dr. Uh, Millen, and congratulations on your recent achievement as well. Thank you. Um, so the background there is I just defended my PhD in December, and my official graduation is actually tomorrow. So newly minted PhD. Congratulations. <laughs> um, I, I think computer science as a field is unique in the fact that it touches every other field. You cannot go anywhere nowadays without running into computers somewhere, right? Whether it's fast food work or retail or shipping, anywhere that people have industry, computers are now also there. And computer science gives you that unique quality of being able to tie in what you're interested in with computer science. So now you can go make that field better in ways that you can think of and you know you can research. Mm -hmm. uh, I also do want to give out another shout out to Access Computing. Uh, throughout my undergrad and grad career, I've met tons of awesome people through them. I've had the opportunity to uh, do research with them and work on so many different projects and uh, they've also supplied funding for travel. So being able to go out to conferences and actually meet the people you've been collaborating with is really awesome. So use the resources. Access computing should be your number one uh, priority to look up and see what they can do. Thank you very much. I second uh, your opinion. Uh, actually, as a blind uh, person myself, I actually uh, greatly indebted to access computing thank you very much for the resource i highly recommend access computing as well and thank you very much for everyone for attending um, this panel and thank you very much uh, the panelists um, for your great input and i hope that everyone um, had a great chance to learn from your insights and experience um, and please enjoy the re uh, the remaining session as well and thank you very much Thank you. Thank, thank you, all. you all. This is uh, Denise. Um, I'd like to thank Ju Young for moderating. Um, this was an excellent panel. Thank you so much for your insightful um, answers to Ju's questions, Ju Young's questions. And um, it's kind of a really fantastic example of how we're all kind of standing on the shoulders of the, the folks that came before us, right? So. Um, that's what this symposium is about, is inspiring the next generation. And I think you all did just that. So thanks again. Totally agree. This is Adrian. I really, really appreciate all of that. And in a planned convenience, our next panel is our K through 12 educators. Um, so to take some of these ideas of what you guys presented and you, you didn't allude to, you very directly said, Get us get this involved in uh, younger education in, in K through 12. We're going to have mostly representatives from Schools for the Blind, which I would like to say is a resource for any of you out there as teachers, parents, students um, to find your local school for the blind. They may be doing something along the lines of a coding camp 
um, or an after school coding club or have a little bit more time to spend on computer science principles specific to blind kids. Um, on that note, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to reaching out to all four of you in the future for the California School for the Blind uh, coding camps and opportunities. I'd love to find a way to partner with university students and all of you and find a way to really make it a more robust uh, experience that really dives into the concepts of coding. Um, very excited about our coding camp this summer, but I know that I know that we can grow it and make it even more. Absolutely. And thanks again for the invitation. I appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. All right. Pleasure's all ours. Thank you. Beautiful. Um, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, my name is Adriana Mandy. I'm the director of the California Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. Um, I'm very excited about this current panel uh, full of my peers, teachers of students with visual impairments and educators um, in the field of K through 12. The panel is called, How Do We Teach Coding to Students with Visual Impairments? Our moderator, Robin Lowell, is the Senior Manager, Manager of Accessibility at I2E, Insight to Education. Vanessa Herndon is the Low Vision Clinic uh, and Classroom Coordinator at the California School for the Blind. Amanda Rhoda is a math and computer science teacher. She's a teacher of the visually impaired at Washington State School for the Blind. And Sarah Larkin is the statewide math consultant at the Iowa Educational Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired. I know that you guys all might get a chance to explain a little bit further, but Robin, I'm gonna give the floor to you. Great, thank you, Adrian. And sorry for the delays, but we'll just get moving forward. I am so excited to be here and to hear from all these amazing, amazing professionals about coding with our students with our blind and low vision and what it all means. So let's get started and jump in and have our present presenters and tell us just like in a in a quick few words about yourself and exactly what you're doing and your passions. So how about Sarah? Let's start with you. Sure. Um, as was mentioned, I'm from the from Iowa. I work for the Iowa Educational Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired. I've been there since 2007. Uh, we offer short-term programs in computer programming. Um, and before that, before 2007, I actually taught high school math, computer programming, and computer networking. So it's always been a love of mine from the beginning. It's nice to be able to share it with other students. Great. Oh, Vanessa or Amanda, uh, whoever feels like jumping in. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, my name is Vanessa Herndon, and I am a TBI at California School for the Blind. I'm currently in the low vision clinic. Um, and before that, I had my own classroom, and I spent some time in the tech lab. But I think my biggest passion, I don't have a background in like math or computer science um, formally, but my and I think every TBI's passion is like making sure that something is accessible. And so that what that is what got me into coding um, or making coding accessible to students. And so I'm happy to be here to share uh, how somebody without a background can try and make this accessible. Great, um, Amanda, let's hear from you. I teach uh, sixth through 12th grade math and computer science at the Washington State School for the Blind. So we're a residential uh, campus and kids from all over Washington and um, parts of Oregon come hang out with us. And um, I teach everything from robots and computer game design to uh, both AP computer science courses. Great, awesome, I'm so excited to um, hear from you all. And just a little bit about myself. I was a TVI as well before I left the classroom and I actually um, was itinerant in Central Oregon and at, uh, worked at the Washington State School for the Blind where yeah, I, I was a founding, mem founding <laughs> member of, uh, yeah, I have, Amanda has my job. <laughs> I was the, uh, um, I started the distance learning math program at WSSB and kind of went from there. And that just really, you know, sparked that passion for um, ensuring that all of our students have access to all the STEM fields. So I'm excited to hear from, from you all. So let's just jump in and start talking about things. So my first question is, is let's just do it from a higher level, thinking about 
beginning coding and advanced coding, um, those programs aren't necessarily accessible to all of our students. So I just want to dig in just a little bit and hear from you all about what issues you're really finding around coding that is not making it accessible? Um, and what are you doing to help bridge that gap with these programs that are out that, that are they're fantastic programs, but they're just not working for our kiddos. So whoever would like to start. So, you know, what are you seeing out there that's not working and what are you doing to um, do what we do best, be creative and hack our way through things? ahead and start. Um, in Iowa, we don't have a school for the blind anymore. Um, all of our students are out in their local school districts. And in Iowa, we have a lot of teachers using code.org, which it is just really not accessible. And we find it in three areas. Um, first, just navigating the environment itself uh, between the different windows that are within the apps have been a struggle. Um, secondly, the input, although you can change it to text from the blocks um, in the editor, uh, we still find that depending on which lesson you're in, sometimes the students can navigate that input and other times not. And then the third area is the output because many of their outputs are very visual. Um, so we've um, worked around it a few different ways. Um, Sometimes we give them experience with alternatives, um, but but we don't. Depending on the teacher, sometimes they're more willing to to let us have the students use those alternatives, and sometimes um, they kind of dig in a little bit more um, because they believe in the the pairing within code.org of them with their peers. Um, so we have actually um, had paraeducators. Um, from a basic level, even set up some of those uh, displays of where a character is, where they need to get to on things like the hundreds board uh, or graph paper so that the students can still do the coding and access the same process that the other students are having so they can also have the discussions around what they're thinking with their peers. Um, and then um, other times we do use alternatives. So for instance, at the high school level, because many of the lessons within Quorum have been aligned with code.org principles, um, we do have students using Quorum Studio as um, part of their programming, um, but then also access some of the other lessons with their peers. Great. Um, and you guys like to add to that? Oh, I agree with Sarah. <laughs> and, Sam. Um, and uh, code.org uh, is is great at providing teaching, um, providing teachers with tools they need to be able to give all to give kids computer science uh, access. But it is just the bane of the screen reader world. Um, that's actually like. So it's not necessarily the languages that are inaccessible and they touched on it in the last um, presentation. It's the curriculum or the compiler or the IDE, the IDE you're using and these boxed curriculums that are all web-based. However, they've designed these web-based things as their compilers just blocks the screen reader. And it's so hard for the students to have that same interaction. Um, for my AP CSP, I use the quorum curriculum. I'm a little biased. I help write it. So <laughs> um, for my younger students, because I do teach middle schoolers, um, I, I, I do not like the pair a low vision kid with a blind kid. So one person can move around the screen and one kid can't. I hate that. I hate that idea. Um, because somebody's always othered in that situation. And that's the last thing our kids need is another time that they're othered. Uh, so I've used uh, cardboard cutouts of the blocks and we've literally shifted the blocks around um, there. And I never get the name of it right, but there is a school here in Washington who has some 3D printed code.org blocks. Um, I haven't used those, but I've sent that link on to 
some of the public school teachers who who call me and ask how can I help my kid participate. Um, but yeah, I get a hundred board out so they can do the pixel work. I get whatever we have around the room. Um, everything short of puffy paint, I think, has been used to simulate. Um, and then this year, um, I used APH's Code Quest with my kids. I just really would like that one to go to the next level. <laughs> it stops too soon. My kids completed it in a week. So um, we've used Code Jumper and I am so tired of mashed potatoes and green beans on the ceiling and on the floor. Uh, that is one of the poems in Code Jumper and my kids think it's hilarious. And uh, I've heard it more times in the past week than ever. So we're gonna learn next week how to record our own sounds. Yay. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, but yeah, I just, I make tactiles so the kids can physically put the blocks together. And then unfortunately in that case, somebody's got to slide them around for them, but at least it's their code and they can see the way it fits together and they can see the way it flows. Absolutely. All right, Vanessa. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys had really great uh, very applicable and actionable things that you're doing with kids. But the thing that I'm seeing the most that's keeping kids from, from coding is that is just like the fear of coding, not in the student, but in people around the student. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you guys talking about different ways that you're doing it. And I know that it's not always perfect, but I do want to reiterate that it is text-based. So like any way you make text accessible, you could in theory make coding accessible to a kid. You could, if you had a transcriber or the time, you could copy the text out of the inaccessible app and put it in a Word document and emboss it for your student. And it would be accessible. Um, it would, they wouldn't have you know everything there, but they would have something. Um, so, I mean, I've just heard too many things about students being pulled out or services being scheduled at that time. And I think it's really important that we look at the resources that we have and we partner with teachers who are already teaching in our schools uh, to, to think about, okay, I see this app, but it's like drag and drop. Is there another way that we can teach this? Are there ways that we can make activities that kids get their hands on and they move blocks or can we use this code jumper as a full classroom um, so I think demystifying it as just text and partnering with general ed teachers who are already teaching this is going to be the best way to just at least get started uh, absolutely and you know that really leads me into the next question that I want to um, to ask and a topic to talk about so if we look at the labor statistics from the Department of Labor, there are approximately 1.4 million, million computer science jobs out there that are unfilled and only about 400,000 qualified applicants. That's, that's a huge disparity of the talent pool versus the need, right? And that goes for CS, that goes for cybersecurity. There's so many different areas. So looking at this, we have this huge untapped talent market in our students that we could be really starting them from a young age. And what I love to say when I'm doing code jumper work is, yes, I can, you know, it's, it's creating a mindset. And so thinking about our littles, so our pre-K going all the way up through higher ed after talking to so many different um, professionals who are blind or low vision in computer science there, there's a lot of, I wish I would have. So thinking about this, a demand for talent, what should we be doing and what are we doing to help our kids from the beginning understand that idea of, yes, I can code or yes, I am able. And not only the kiddos, but those around them. So let's just have a discussion. Talk amongst yourselves, talk with me. You can you know, jump on in each other. We don't have to really go in an order, but really think about and let's talk about let's change the mindset and where do we need to start and what are we already doing well in that changing the mindset of yes, I can. I think representation matters a lot. And so if you're here with your student or you're having your student sign up and having them listen to people who are successful in this field and enjoying it, that is a really great step. Mm -hmm. um, to see that that is an option is huge for, for just getting the motivation. 
and getting the interest. Absolutely. If somebody want to jump in, I can talk more on that. <laughs> I was going to say, I've, I've found a lot of success, even with some of my older students. Um, so in Washington now, uh, students can take AP computer science principles um, to meet graduation requirements for like the state math test. And many of our students don't so hot, do so hot on that test. So we are encouraging them with swift pushes to take the AP class. And many of them are like, I don't, coding, programming, computer science, uh, no, what, no. So I start with very basic things like the code and go mouse, which out of the box is accessible. The only thing not accessible is the little language cards. And I just take the feel and peel stickers and put arrows or circles or whatever on them. And then everybody can play with the mouse. And even 17, 18 year olds like learning the basics of step-by-step -step algorithmic thinking by having a mouse chase around a board to find the cheese. So like, even though they're, you know, big kids on their way to college and all these things, using some of the very basic younger tools to get them to see they can do it, it's that I can do it, uh, then I can hand them something that's real code or, you know, text-based or whatever, and they're less afraid. So giving them those opportunities to just play with something kind of fun and, and silly has really helped me break through some of the older students who don't think they can. And Sarah, as, as an itinerant, as someone who's not in a school for the blind, you know, and I spent many years in that world too. So I'm interested to hear what, what you think about in this whole different world of um, how we, we get that yes, I can attitude. We've taken advantage of the opportunities to offer short-term programs to pique that interest um, so that they can get their hands on some of these uh, tools that are accessible. Um, so we also have used, for instance, the Code and Go mouse. We've used Botley, Dash, uh, Swift Playgrounds um, so that they get access to kind of some different environments and some different options. Uh, and part of that too is even helping them advocate for themselves. Um, when they get to the classroom so that they can let their teachers know, yes, I can do this. This is just what I need to be able to do it. Um, and th the other thing I've been trying to do a lot of lately as well from a behind the scenes perspective is meeting with some of those professors of computer science and, and talking to their classes too about that born accessible idea and how when they go out and they look at, at coding in whatever field they go into, that they think about it from that perspective as well, instead of producing these things that are just visual. Yeah, absolutely. I will say also, I think that a lot of students and especially like coming from the perspective of an adult being like, oh, this could be great. Like, it's a great job. You can make a lot of money, but it's also a very creative and fun thing to do. And so I think that, you know, not everybody is in a position where they're creating curriculum, but if you find like at a school for the blind or, or at your school, if there's a curriculum where kids are like building robots and programming robots, um, just getting that hands-on experience. There are fun ways of doing it. Like Amanda said, the code and go robot mouse. And then there's also like really fun, like games and puzzles that you can do with, with peers, like, um, program a friend teaches you, like I give my friend commands to like find some spot in the room and that teaches you like what a command is. So just making sure that they have access to these really hands-on ways and also like challenging this idea, like if there's a problem, let's break it down and think about it. What kind of problem do you want to solve in the world? Is there a problem that you face every day? And really bringing it home to be relevant to them. Um, because I think it, as a concept, seems pretty dry sometimes until students realize the application. Uh, absolutely. I, I agree. It's that um, 
you know, if you make it applicable to your life and, and, and coding is something we do every single moment of every single day without realizing it. And we can bring that those aha moments of, oh, wait a minute, you just coded how you're tying your shoes. You just coded how you're going to actually move across the classroom. And especially thinking about O&M, that whole, you know, that's just that, that makes my eyes light up this idea of connecting O&M and coding. It's just this huge area again. And someone in the chat was talking about too much talking, not enough doing. And, you know, and, and if we think about coding as this all encompassing idea um, that, and computer science is something we do all the time as our brains are computers that, you know, it's, it, it makes it relevant. It makes it um, important to us and our students as human beings is like, oh, I'm doing this all the time. You mean I could do this as a profession? Wow. You know, so there's a lot of great opportunities there of creating these, these, these mindsets. So thank you. Those are um, awesome ideas. So now, we, now, let's, now let's take it to a, um, a different direction. Okay. So we all know math is so many of our kids' favorite subjects. They just can't wait to get to math class. Yep. They love learning math. And as much as we get excited about math ourselves, um, it's not always our students' favorite. But you know, over the years, and especially at my time starting at WSSB, thinking about taking all these subjects out of a silo, because in the real world, you don't do math one hour a day, and then you don't do English just, you know, in, in the real world. Really making this, um, you know, working on the concept that we do all these things together, just like we were talking about coding is every, in everything we do. So math being such a difficult subject for a lot of our kids, and they see it as such a barrier to moving on. Amanda, how you said that, you know, kids, they don't always pass our um, high school math. Um, so ideas, thoughts around taking all of this stuff out of the silo and putting it together in these great holistic experiences? Well, I've had, um, so one of my classes is an elective class for um, some of our multiple needs students. Um, they're in our learning support class. So I do try and really wrap other things into um, the, the, pro, the computer science class they have. And, you know, even with like right now, they're, they're, they're playing with Code Jumper again. We used it a little bit at the beginning of the year and they're back into it. And, you know, they had to uh, sequence row, row your boat. Mm -hmm. Well, I had them write it out first, write out the song, row, row your boat. Great. That's what you're going to go code now. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, you, those of you who don't know what Code Jumper is, it's got some pre-programmed sounds that you can push through with pods and it's super cool and I love it. Um, but you have to dial through to find the right sounds. So they had to do that sequencing. And then uh, we played with the timing of it because it was talking too fast. It was like there was no period in our sentence. And we kind of, I, I played with some of those things to get them to be thinking about English class while we were still doing a round of row, row your boat in the classroom. Um, so it, I, I've done a lot of things like that. Um, also, I've had students program their own Mad Libs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they write the story and they leave the blanks and then their friends can go through the program and fill in the blanks. So you've got like that assessment part where the student has to label what blank they've said correctly, right? And then when you pass it off to your friend, do they fill it in correctly? So like from a teacher assessment point on, you know, different parts of speech, it's, it's great and they love it. And then they don't even realize they're taking a test or working on the skill or whatever. So I, I've done a lot of kind of sneaky things like that. I have a kid who wants to use a calculator, so I made him program the calculator before I let him use it. Right. He had to make sure, he had to show me he understood the functions and what it meant to add, what it meant to subtract, multiply, divide before he was able to then use the calculator that he programmed. That's so fantastic. Those are some of the things that I've done to kind of integrate programming with my students. 
we in our, in some of our programs that we've offered, we've tried to add in a lot of those those other types of skills. Um, so, for instance, even the basics of um, moving in a square and what that means to even move in a basic square. And so we would build on the basics of them walking. Uh, we just took puzzle pieces, foam puzzle pieces and put them out in a square. Um, and that way they had, when they were walking on them, they could tell whether they were on the squares or off of the squares. Um, but then they could actually walk that square and think about the pieces that were involved in that. Then we would go from them doing it physically to them maneuvering just a teddy bear on graph paper around that same square before trying to get into using the actual robot to do something like that. Um, because them going through those actions really helped give them a better foundation for moving into the actual coding. I really like that, Sarah. That's a really great example of moving from something concrete like an experience based, like they're walking on the squares, they feel their body in space. And then they can over time relate that to, I'm moving this like character one space forward and turning right, which is more representational. And that that is a really important con concept development that coding has helped to reinforce. And I think coding can help to reinforce or maybe be a motivator for things like math um, you know, you do, you don't necessarily need to know a lot of math, like you do need to know logical thinking and maybe some algebra, but like also a lot of coding already like has those built in math functions for you. So you don't act like you can maybe see what, okay, I, I had a hard time with math as a high schooler and only until college was I like, I had took a statistics class and I got it. And, and I think it's because it finally made sense. Like, oh, I see why this is important. I can see it in relationship to the reasons why we're looking for these numbers. And so if you can ex make that same experience with like, if students understand why they're doing math versus like, I have to memorize this thing, then that might be a jump. I think another thing, especially for math, because it does play a lot into programming when you get higher up is, making sure students have access to tactile graphics and manipulatives from a young age. Um, and, you know, that, that exercise that you were saying, like jumping to one square to the next and then feeling it on the table and then moving on, like really starting to understand that graphics can be a representation and then how to use them and then how to relate this spatial awareness to something on the computer that is really abstract. Um, I think is really important. Yeah, I, I agree. It's that taking that that abstract and making it concrete. And so for many of our students from the math math experience, I remember years ago, I was thinking, okay, how am I going to teach my students in, I think it was in, I can't remember if it was algebra one. Oh, I think it was in geometry. It was um, vanishing point. I'm like, oh my goodness, A, I'm at a distance and B, how am I going to teach vanishing point? And I'm like, okay, put my creative brain on and thinking about it. And I could see how this could actually, we could relate it to um, coding and computer science. So what I ended up doing was changing the modality, changing it to an auditory experience. Okay, when, you, when a car is driving by, when it's close to you, is it loud or quiet? Well, it's loud. Well, what happens when it drives away? It gets quieter, which we equate to being smaller, just like vanishing point comes is from seeing something very large and then it's further away, it looks really small. So it's creating these opportunities of these abstract concepts and making it um, into a format that they can really understand and then apply in that abstract world, which is really important. And I had a student who, um, middle schooler using Python, um, and and the screen reader and it was it was so hard because we were at loops and it's just like parentheses 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 all over the place parentheses and so it's like what are we going to do so code jumper we went backwards and we gave him code jumper going let's build a loop in code jumper and then so it's like this is a loop and that, that tactile experience of building it 
and hands on and then going, oh, okay, so I see it, we're going around. And then I equate it to, um, uh, then I took it back to O&M. So this is like walking down the street and you're going around in a cul-de-sac and then you're continuing on your way. And it's like, oh, okay, I have this action moment of the loop and then moving forward, just like crossing a street or whatever it is. So coding helps us really, you know, thinking about it from the basics, it helps our students to break down all of these big concepts, which is a great executive function um, concept that so many kids struggle with. It's breaking it down into its base pieces to understand it and then be able to reassemble it and move forward with the concept. We can do that with math, writing, just daily living skills all across the board. It's, it's, it's really amazing to be able to take these concepts, which again goes back to that idea of yes, I can code and why it's so important for our youngers and to start that idea from a young age of, of oh yeah, this is something that I can do and, and, and apply all those processes um, to so many different aspects of their life, um, which is I think is, is really important to keep in mind when we're thinking about coding because so many teachers and adults and we're just scared to death of it. And they're like, oh yeah, forget about it. I can't do that. But if, if we can tell our preschoolers they can code, we can code too. I mean, really at the end of the day, awesome. All right, so thinking about that, okay, moving from math. Now let's, let's go to our high school and post high school kiddos. Um, students who are thinking about pursuing a career in computer science and which we are very short on, in this world or math based or math heavy degrees, they really our students face a really unique challenge in, in, in accessibility across the board. Um, what do you feel like the greatest challenges are for our students and how are we engaging those challenges and teaching our kids to advocate and overcome those challenges or adapt to those challenges or we got adaptations or whatever. Um, so in the K-12 system, to help get our kids ready for life in either computer science or mathematics or math heavy. Um, and I've had so many students who are like, yeah, I'm gonna go be this. I'm like, yes, you can. So we have to prep now. So what are you guys doing to help our students get ready? One of the, you mentioned advocacy. So that whole independence and self-advocacy is big, but also, allowing them to make mistakes. Because if you think about computer programming, a big part of it is trial and error and learning from those errors that you make and debugging those programs. Um, and so often with our students out in their local school districts, they're, the, they're often the only student who's blind or visually impaired in that school. And you get these paraeducators who want to jump in and not allow them to make those mistakes. And you can't allow a student to become a problem solver if you don't let them encounter problems. Um, so for me, that's probably one of the biggest things. And so for even having students learn to self-advocate in that, let me try this on my own instead of just allowing someone to to dig in the minute they start doing something incorrectly. I, yeah, I, that is, that's the key thing I've really um, worked on a lot with my students um, this year because it's been such an interesting year trying to teach um, was that I don't, I don't care if you got the question wrong. I care that you tried, I care that you put it out there and then tell me how you got there. Like if you can explain your steps to a wrong answer, we all know like while you're starting to talk through it, you usually go, oh, hmm. So having my, I really, really worked on the making them explain what they did right, wrong, I don't care tell me what you did and how. Um, and I think moving on to anything in life, being able to explain your reasoning is one of the, the key, you know, skills we need. And telling them that it's okay that they got it wrong, telling them it's okay that they failed something 
It's not the end of the world if you did it wrong. And um, yeah, I think so many, I think so many students period, uh, not just our VI students, but just students period, think they have to get an A every time. Think it has to be perfect. The, the first time they run their code, the first time they turn in a paper, if it's first, if it's perfect the first time, why am I teaching you? <laughs> what, what's the point of me teaching you if you get it perfect every time? So uh, I've really, that's, that's the skill I've been really trying to hone with my students is that, that being able to explain what you did and being okay with getting it wrong. Um, I had a, I had a group doing a robotics challenge and I knew exactly what they did wrong in the code as they were telling me to put it into the robot and I just let it go. And sure enough, robot was supposed to end up in like the back left corner and it's over here in the front right corner. And I went, all right, what'd we do wrong? But they learn a little, a whole lot more by making those mistakes and thinking about if what, I had gone, oh, did it oh, do oh. what it was doing. Yeah. Do you mean left, not right? You know, <laughs> yeah. what? How does that really help them? So, the computer yeah. science has their own special word. They have debugging. I mean, it's such a glorious part of it that we have a very special word for making an error. Well, and so, even okay. last year, um, there's a there's a thing in computer science that's you know rubber duck debugging, mm -hmm. where you have your little rubber duck and you explain the problem to the rubber duck. And again, it's as you're talking it out, you find your own mistake. I gave rubber ducks to all of my students last year. <laughs> Fun. math or computer science and it was if you're stuck talk to the duck like, look at your own work first and then ask for help so this year I couldn't do that but they'll be back next year <laughs> Robin I apologize my automatic timed light in my office went off as you were asking the question and I didn't catch if it oh. was this like skills related to the ICC that we're teaching yeah. through coding or? That, that's that's what we're talking about next. That's great. Oh, great. So okay. we, were, we were just talking about, you know, thinking about the unique challenges and what our students really need to do in K-12 to be ready for higher ed or wherever it takes them. And basically the consensus was, um, yeah, you know, advocacy skills and okay with failure, which I, I Absolutely. agree. Absolutely. I, I definitely, second everything you guys are saying. If a student believes in themselves as a learner, I think that is the biggest jumping off point that they could have. They're already at an advantage if they believe in themselves. So now let's talk into the ECC, thinking about computer science and coding and all these things we're talking about. We already talked about one overlapping opportunity in the expanded core curriculum. But what other areas and opportunities do you all see to blend these two together to help our students go through that curriculum, the ECC, and, and, um, and mesh this idea of coding and computer science together? I mean, I think a lot of people have called out self-advocacy so many times and also this like tenacity that you build up from having something try and fail in a, an environment where something is supposed to fail, you know, like getting comfortable with failure and then trying again and asking for what you need. And I think um, that those kinds of skills are going to be really helpful for them. But also like if you're teaching self-advocacy with a student and you're doing coding, or maybe you're doing technology with them and you come across a, a website that's not accessible, having some knowledge of coding already and like the way that things are supposed to work are going to have them be a better advocate for themselves because they can say, hey, your button was mislabeled, which is a very specific thing to, to give to a help desk center that's not like, I can't access this. Like nobody knows what you mean when you say I can't access this. So I think that self-advocacy is a huge theme in coding, not just for all the things that we said, but also for making them better advocates for their community in terms of accessibility, whether it's connecting to a help desk or like going on to program something, like they can affect it at multiple levels. Absolutely. Um, 
Yeah. And there's also like social skills involved in doing that. And you're using tech at the same time to like reinforce typing and editing and email their friends their code to get it back to edit it. And they're learning Braille that whole time or reading in Braille that whole time or developing their listening skills that whole time. Like there are a lot of ways to tie it to the ECC. Uh, we did a, a, we did the, um, the week of code in December, you know, when everybody was, pre everything was pretty much locked down at that time. And um, we had them focus on algorithms related to their independent living skills or daily tasks um, mm -hmm. and what they might do. And, you know, there's so many conditionals loops that happen within their day um, that just thinking about what goes into the steps that you take in a normal day. Um, was something that was easy to incorporate. Um, the other thing I think that is important is, is those keyboarding and screen reading type skills as the students get older. Um, we talk about some of that independence, um, them being able to type their code themselves is also an important skill um, that we were able to um, integrate and then along with that social interaction, there's that whole idea of um, problem solving with a peer and having those conversations because you all have different perspectives in the way you think about things. So um, there's some nice uh, social interaction pieces that go into that, including reading each other's code mm -hmm. and giving them feedback on their code as well. Yeah, right. my, um, yeah, my students yeah. just wrapped up the uh, create task for the AP exam. And this year I had to choose to collaborate on it. And not that I've graded code because I can't yet for another like five days or something weird like that. Looking over their code, uh, having that collaboration between the two students, it's much a stronger, it's a much stronger project than the ones who I'll do it myself. So, um, yeah, that collaboration really helped them out a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. So in our in our last couple of minutes, I just let's bring this back full circle. Um, what advice or what would you like to tell all of our teachers? Um, where, how, when to look for support when they are faced with computer science or encoding um, and looking at curriculum for students, where should, where should the students start? When and where? And do you feel like there's any prerequisites that you should be doing with our kids? So any advice we have just to kind of wrap it up with all of, with all of our teachers um, and, and whoever else is interested and, and where do we go from here? I think all kids need to start the logic and sequencing program when we started in school. So kindergarten, first grade. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's part of your general education curriculum, then our students should be part of it too. Um, you know, they, they make, you know, the Code and Go robot says it's for kindergarten. Um, but yeah, I still use it with older kids. I, use it, I have fun with it myself, whatever, it's great. Um, so yeah, start whenever the general education group's gonna do it, everybody should do it. I really agree with starting it super early like that. The nice thing about the robots, robots is that instant feedback mm -hmm. that is tactual. Um, I also, when I'm visiting with teachers, talk a lot about that whole multi-sensory approach that works for all students. Um, that bringing in those other senses besides just the visual um, also works for the students that have vision. So um, bringing in those pieces is so important. Um, and I think just throughout um, starting students with some of those basic uh, computer and keyboarding skills is going to ultimately increase those skills when they really need it uh, for the more advanced coding. Um, I definitely agree. Start them when everybody else is starting them and that and keyboarding is 
especially touch typing is going to be super important. Um, and I think that partnering with the general ed teacher and, and figuring out ways to make it accessible to your student is also going to make it accessible to everybody else. Mm -hmm. If you bring in that code and go robot mouse as, uh, or like if, you know, maybe that's not in your budget for low incidence, but you say, hey, there's this really great experiential thing. I know you're doing this next year. Let's get some hands on things. So every student, no matter how they learn, can have some, some sort of supplemental understanding um, that supplements the curriculum. Or, you know, just like look at, look at it ahead of time, ask people, make friends with, with teachers and try and bridge that gap. Because I think most of the time, uh, as TVIs, we know that we need to make things accessible, right? But it, most of the time when we're talking, it might be that we're afraid or we think, oh, okay, coding is accessible, therefore I need to teach it. You don't, but you do, you can start a conversation with a teacher and say, these are the different ways that my kid accesses things. How do you think we can make this accessible to them? Here are maybe some things that I have, you know, like there's going to be a list of resources here that you can bring to a teacher and say, code and go robot mouse. And, other things from APH like the code jumper and like other hands-on things that'll supplement for every single student, uh, they'll all benefit from whatever is, is helping your student. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, thinking about, you know, universal design for learning, you know, it's just that what's good for, you know, our kids is going to be great for everyone in that classroom. And then the more opportunities we have to bring our students in and doing what the what the, um, their whole class is doing and when the class is doing things that they usually do again it brings them into their you know their kid in the class and everybody's uh, doing you know the same thing it may be a little different but everybody's experiencing co jumper or the mouse project you know there's so many opportunities um, if we collaborate with our um, gen ed teachers if we create this um, experience where multi-sensory, multi-modal um, learning is, is benefits all of our kids. And it also helps that gen ed teacher with another level of understanding that they can take forward in their practice as well, moving forward. Like, oh, I remember we did this and then bringing it in and creating more of that universal design, which will benefit every every student that we, that, that is in the classroom in, in different ways. And I've experienced that with CoJumper where CoJumper was a station. And so the kids went to um, they did co.org and they did an unplugged version and then they did a a um like the unplug was a physical and they were building and things but it's all these sensory activities that the students all did and to the best of their ability so at the end of the day um i would say you know engage the classroom engage the students and um dive into coding and and don't be afraid for our kids and, and our staff and um, yeah, so any final thoughts from our panel? I have a 30 second shameless plug. All right. So WSSB, the Maryland School for the Blind and APH are uh, piloting, piloting an asynchronous APCSP that will be accessible to the blind next year. Um, there are currently roughly four seats open um, that are not filled by one of the two schools. And uh, if you're interested, please, uh, if you've got a kid who's maybe off in La La Land somewhere and wants to take an AP class. Um, <clears throat> I mean, my high school next door doesn't offer the same IP, AP class I do. So uh, give, us a, give us a shout out, let us know. And um, we can have your kid take an AP class. That'll be accessible and fun there might be a duck involved, just so you know. All right, well, when I take it, Amanda? Uh, I can add you to the canvas and you can work through it, sure. Great. <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. That was, that was not a shameless plug, Amanda. That was on my to-do list. I was like, I'm not gonna let these guys get off the hook without mentioning that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank, thank you to all of you for participating. I really love the way that melded from our university approach down to our K-12 education and recognizing and appreciating how important 
a technology basis to get kids interested in accepting that coding is something they can do. Um, and I think, uh, I think everybody believes that and is motivated by your presence to be able to go do that and make that happen. So that's a big motivation of why we put together this coding symposium is to convince our teachers and convince our students that they can take what they do know and go a little bit further and hopefully spread that knowledge and information base out to their peers and networks to encourage others to do the same. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. You guys were absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Yeah.